Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Weekly Spinner Rack. I'm actually starting this show about 45 seconds early. Why? Because that's the power that I have. It's my show. Hello, everybody. Look at that. I'm just giving you salute after salute. I'm throwing them virtually through my webcam at you. My name is Chris. What's this show? I call it the Weekly Spinner Rack because we're going to talk about the comics that came out this week. Um, I was able to get a pair of comics at Emerald City Comic Con this week that uh, actually aren't on store shelves until this Wednesday. So we'll talk a little bit about them. And one of them is a little exciting because uh, while we've got a lot of news and reviews, and maybe even art to do tonight, we also have a special guest, a guest who I will say is making a triumphant return to comics after uh, uh, working in Hollywood for the last 10 years. We're going to bring him on. We've got a special guest today, folks. Hey, Chris, how's it going? This. Derek Kirk Kim. Hi, it has been a pleasure getting to uh, know you a tiny bit over the last couple of weeks online. And now we got to see each other face to face. This How are all, you? I, I'm sorry I have to copy you, but the double salute. There we go. A double everyone. salute. I appreciate it. I do oh that all the goodness. time. I do it to my girlfriend all the time. It <laughs> doesn't mean anything <laughs> at all. Um, um, it was it was really really nice uh, getting to see you at uh, Emerald City Comic Con this week. So I was just curious, you know, um, uh, how how was the convention for you? I, I have you been doing um, conventions at all lately? This is the third convention I've been. Um, I started going again at the end of last year, and yep. um, and uh, it, it was really really fun. Uh, my book launched there, so it launched three days ahead of uh, comic book stores. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. And um, Image was uh, uh, generous enough to let me uh, launch it there, and um, we gave a copy to every person that came to the Image panel. So it was. Uh, it was oh, did very, you? That's yeah. a great idea. Yeah, it That's was really great. really exciting. And um, but I did I, I did I did get sick like right before the, it, the convention uh, started, and uh, I was this close to canceling because I, I felt uh, I felt really sick. And actually, my. Aww. My voice normally isn't this sexy, but um, uh, it, it, I have a really terrible sore throat right now. But I, I can't. I have to do. I have to. I have to muscle through it to be here with you, Chris. Because uh, I, I want to just take a little. Uh, so I don't mean to embarrass you, but I am a huge fan of your channel, both comic shows and pros and cons. I'm so embarrassed. I never, I never miss it. <laughs> I never miss it. I. Um, your, your, uh, yours is the way that. Um, oh, thank you so much. Uh, yours, your show is the way I keep track of the the comics news. Um, so <laughs> I mean, I'm I just think... basically an aggregator who's riffing on the stuff, but it's fun for us and like all these great people that like show up in the live chat to just talk comics. Um, but thank yeah. you, thank, thank you so much. You yeah. know, and um, uh, wait, 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 no, not no, just... you, don't get it, you don't get away that easily. So then uh, I discovered comic shows uh, early when I was first starting the Last Mermaid. And so I, I, as I was working, as I was drawing, I would literally just have your playlist like playing automatically, just one really the next. Yeah. So like I've spent so much time with you um, drawing. That's I feel great. like I know you. It's so, it's so strange to be on this side now, like uh, actually it, being next to you and talking to you and you're like actually responding to me. This is it, really cool. it is kind of funny. Like, you know, I, 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 I bet that there are like, you know, uh, people in, in the comics industry like this, that, that feel this when they go to conventions, but there is sort of like this um, interesting parasocial uh, uh, relationship where, I, I do get reactions at this point. It, it is kind <laughs> oh, of funny, easy. like, you know, especially at Comic-Con. But overall, yeah. it's fantastic. It, it's fantastic because, you know, I'm, I just love talking about comics. It's my it's my favorite medium. I, I'm yeah. excited to talk to you specifically, Derek, because of a couple things. You have made comics in a lot of different formats. Yeah. And yeah. you you kind of started early on. I would say you're honestly like one of the earlier people to have done online comics. That's what you were doing before anything else, right? The online um, comics thing. I did have a little stint in print before that, but yeah, okay. I, I, I was actually, um, yeah, I was one of the few, uh, I was kind of like in that group that like Scott McLeod was championing when he was yeah. really 
getting into online comics. So I, I was really that. lucky. I was really lucky that I was part of that initial group because if I did done it now, I mean, I would just be buried in the sea of amazing online comics now. But at the time, I think, uh, oh, thank you, Joe. Um, I, but now, um, but at the time, I think I think it was pretty unique that um, not only was it a webcomic, but it was a, a subject matter that that comics normally hadn't seen. So I think I got really lucky. It, yeah. It, 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 yeah. And I think that like, there's just a lot of interesting things you can do playing with the format, which we're really starting to see, especially out of South Korea. Do you mm -hmm. see family or friends back there, by the way? Actually, um, Wait, hold on one second. Let me just pop over to this bookshelf right here. Uh, so this, I actually have a cousin in Korea who's a manga, uh, also a professional manga artist, or manhwa, sorry, manhwa artist. And That's writer. amazing. Yeah, so she does this book. It's called Tamna the Island. Um, I'm going to mess up the title, but it's like Tamna the Island, something like that. Um, sorry, it's in Korean. So, uh, But um, yeah, it actually got made into a Korean drama. Actually, oh, did it really? Yeah, you yeah. Know, I'm seeing that happen so much even here, though. Like, even here, some of those webtoons are getting turned into Netflix shows left and right. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's just interesting. You know, like, you you were you were a, a little bit of a pioneer there. But, like, we're, we're <laughs> definitely seeing, like, I think that that's going to be a big component of comics mo moving forward. I, I don't know. Like, um, you know, w w when you were doing it, were you, like, uh, doing it to sort of build – uh, an audience to to get opportunities were you trying to monetize it i i, I don't you know it, it's it's a while back now you know it's a, it's like over 20 years so it's like hard for me to sort of remember but what were your goals when you were doing that yeah at the time it was just um uh i wasn't getting much traction in, in the print world and um so i kind of just uh gave up I, I quit i got my first publishing uh, deal actually when i was still um a a junior in um, in college with Antarctic Press. The first oh, work I okay. ever did was actually like a cover on some backup stories for Ninja High School. That's so cool, like, Ben Dunn's book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I worked on that, and then um, and then I pitched my own series to them. It's called Cell, and then they uh, they published that. So, but you know, you're young, you don't know what's going on. Like you, you think you're gonna make a living now, just doing your monthly comic or whatever. And you know, <laughs> it was a rude rude awakening that there's just not much money in comics, especially at that time. It was like right after the uh, collapse, I think, of the bubble. Right, it was um, absolutely. You're right. Yeah, the, yeah. the '90s, like everybody was still recovering. <laughs> And, and then into that world came like, you know, a new way to potentially put ourselves out there. It was just uh, interesting. I mean, I definitely remember that the first thing I read by you was definitely um, same difference. Yeah. Um, and, and am I remembering right? Uh, I'm pretty sure I am. W was that funded in part by the Zurich grant? Um, not, not when I was first serializing it on the, on the web. Not when you were first serializing. Yeah. So I was just, um, I was teaching English as my main, uh, in Korea, as oh. my main, yeah, as my, uh, as my main job. And then on the side, when, when um, I wasn't working, I would work on Same Difference. I keep posting like a few panels every yes. day. And then eventually when it, uh, the story ended, I, I pitched it to the Zero Grant and then um, I was lucky enough to get it. So, yeah. I, I, I love that. I mean, if I was ever... Uh, you know, lucky enough to have one of these YouTube channels that really took off. Like, that's what I would want to like do in part, like is have a grant out there to tell, help um, give rise to new voices. But yeah, like you, you were making a nice splash there in the early 2000s. I mean, I, I cause I remember you got the Eisner for, um, I forget exactly how they phrased it, but like, you know, artists yeah. that deserves more attention, something like yeah, that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. That's pretty yeah. cool to like, all. What was that like? You know, you're telling us that, you know, you were sort of laboring in relative obscurity and, and working a day job. And, and and then all of a sudden, like, you know, you were getting like a Harvey and an Eisner and like all this like attention. Like what 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 was that? What was that like? Most of us don't know what that experience is like. Yeah, it was uh, it was too much. I don't know what the hell. How the hell well, you were young. Yeah, weren't you? <laughs> you were like early 20s, right? Um, no, actually, I was a little older. Maybe, maybe okay. late, late, late twenties. Maybe, maybe okay, late twenties. Okay, um, fair enough. But yeah, I, in retrospect, I kind of wish maybe one of the awards I would have been called to give me some encouragement. But getting all three, like it, I don't know. It just put all this pressure in my own head that nobody was putting on me, but in my own head, like, oh, the next one's gonna be so good and like better than the last or whatever. And it, it like really went into my head and. Um, and they kind of messed with me, <laughs> but uh, but of course at the time it was so exciting, and um, 
I remember at the the I, I got the Eisner and then I got the Ignatz and then at the Harveys I was nominated again. <laughs> And I remember when they were saying the nominees, I was literally saying in my head, please don't pick me, please don't, because I didn't want that much pressure. Like I didn't want that much attention. Oh my goodness, you know you're so I mean? humble. So, and then it's not humble, it's just my own subconsciousness. But I remember um, uh, uh, Jeffrey Brown was nominated in the same category as me, um, right. at the RV, which was for Clumsy. And um, I was praying, I was hoping that he would get it so that I wouldn't have to go up there, but I ended up getting it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, but, uh, but I'm mean, not that I'm complaining. Of course not. It, it was it was amazing, but um, it did kind of mess with my head, I think, a little bit, and and, and probably like fed into my ego too much or something. I don't know. But, hey, because I had a hard fall. Because I had a hard fall right after that, like for a few years, which is why I went out of comics. I went through a really kind of like low point in my life after that. After the first few books didn't, uh, the next few books didn't sell that much, and then oh, I, my series for first second <clears throat> tune. It didn't sell well enough for it to continue. I and, love you. Um, oh, thanks so much, Chris. Yeah. And I, I did you the did first two volumes, right? That's right. Get... I did two. And yeah. then there was supposed to be a third and a fourth to finish oh. the story, but it, it, it didn't sell well enough that um, that they could finish it for a second, which I totally understand. But it, it put me in this real, like, depressed place. Like, I was really depressed. And um, I just felt like a real failure. None of the other books were doing well either. And then so um, I kind of had to retreat to to, uh, to to animation to make a living. And that's interesting that you say that, like retreat, because a lot of us, of course, are thinking, well, hey, you know, like that's where the money is. I I, yeah. I guess I had it in my head that, you know, you used comics to launch yourself into this other thing. But oh, I no. mean, no, not at all. That's if, not if, really if, the case. No, no. If, if Tune had worked out, I, I, I would have just kept doing comics. I mean, I was still doing, um, I was doing some film stuff on top of Tune. Right. I did a web series that was kind of a spinoff of Tune, but that also like didn't, nothing happened with that either. So it was like a double whammy. Like I went all in on the Tune universe and it just completely collapsed. So yeah, but I, it's okay. It's, it's, I, I believe that like, you know, th those ideas can always sort of be like revisited at least. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, you've been working in animation for, you know, like, like, good 10 years working for all all the big companies you know right the disney's and the cartoon yeah. networks and warner brothers and such i mean yeah. I, I think everybody here has at least seen something like adventure time uh, yeah. probably a lot of people here would have seen your work on things like axe cop of course being a comic <laughs> adaptation yeah yeah that was, um, that was I, a really fun one because the art director was one of my best friends he's a cartoonist named john fam but he was also the art director on that show and uh, yeah it was it was a blast to work on that one that's so cool. Um, I'm seeing not everybody that, that's jumping in knows exactly what I'm talking about yet. But folks, uh, just to recap, I'm talking with Derek Kirk Kim about his new comic, the, the Last Mermaid. And what I was about to sort of ask was just sort of, you know, obviously comics has a bit of collaboration, but even at the most, you know, you might only be dealing with like five or six people to make a book or something, whereas right. the animation... Uh, you know, you've got tons of people like, you know, producers and, and, and designers and directors and writers and, and, and of course, all sorts of animators, you know, talk us through like, you know, was it a completely different environment to, to move into all that collaboration or, or was it seamless? You know, was it smooth uh, and, and, and felt organic? I, what would that be like? No, not at all. It, this is totally different. Like when you're doing comics, it's sort of like being a monk, you know? Yeah. Kind of isolated. Solitary. Yeah, solitary. It's very meditative kind of in a way. And then um, when you're in um, animation or just film in general, it's it's very collaborative. There's always people. Um, and in, in a big corporation like Disney, you know, you're like office cubicle, you know, so there's always people around. And yeah, it, it's like night and day. And, and both have their plus and minuses. I love being part of a team like that. That's really fun. You know, being part of a team and you're all working together to, to make something. And like, you know, in comics, you never have that moment where like, you know, a big group of you that work together, screen it together and you're all excited and, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. You don't have that kind of triumphant moment. Right. But at the same time in comics, you have complete creative control and um, there's no notes to deal with or differing opinions that, that, that might cause fights. And, Hmm. Most of the time, it just causes great things, you know, great collaborative things. But there are times, of course, you're going to have friction with um, things. And and um, so, yeah, it's, it's a totally different thing. But I, I actually genuinely love both. You know, OK, ideally, if I if I could, I would love to do something that's collaborative and then solo and then collaborative and solo. So you can go back and forth and not get stuck in. One I can line. understand that. But I, I am. Oh, 
No, I didn't mean to talk over you. I was just saying, like, you know, I, I, I love sort of like, you know, drawing and stuff. But uh, if you're going to tell, like, you know, I, I, I used to do some like self published, more indie stuff a, a good 20 years ago mm -hmm. and um, very fun uh, as long as you, you find some creative fulfillment in it yourself. But it's such a long time to get that reaction from other people. Like, it, it's, mm -hmm. it, it, you, it's, um, you can really get in your own head about it. Exactly. Whereas at least if you're, you're sort of collaborating, there's also sort of some shared responsibility with whether it like does well or not. Like you're like, okay, well, it's not totally. just me. <laughs> it, it's totally a lot less pressure. Yeah. yeah. It's like uh, all the pressure's on the showrunner. <laughs> <That really cool>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you can be a lot more light about, you know, carefree about working on it and, and when it's released then definitely then when um like for example when two was the second one was released i was like i felt so much pressure that to have it sell so that i could continue um i i'm about to ask some questions about last mermaid but just mm -hmm. for my audience i want to put on your radar one book that i really liked by um Derek, uh, it, it's um, it's three separate stories that are published together. It was a collaboration with Jean uh, Lun Yang, uh, Yun Lang. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, the Eternal Smile. I just oh look at that. I'm sorry, I couldn't even quite see that <laughs> so so well. But yeah, you've got like some uh, that's, uh, that's Jean Yun Lang stuff right and there. This is the character from Eternal Smile, uh, Duncan. Duncan Kingdom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> heart heartbreaking heartbreaking you guys like tugged at my strings <laughs> but it also it also really showed me um you've got a lot of uh versatility in terms of what you are doing with your artwork um which which translates a little to this because you know you you've done it, you know an illustrated style you've done sort of a more painterly style i i am curious specifically on the last mermaid like you know uh, how are you creating like some of these pieces? Is is this like digital? Is this watercolors? Like what is this that I'm looking at on, on these pages? Because it's <laughs> yeah. really lush and br br beautiful. I, I'll try to find a nice page that I can show people. Like yeah. there's a lot of like beautiful like color that pops there. Yeah, thank you. It's what are you uh, doing for that Crayola crayons. No, I'm just kidding. It's uh, it's pure digital. It's pure digital, and and I got switched into digital from when I was when I got into animation. So before I got into animation, it was all pen and paper. And then um, once I got to animation, like nobody uses paper anymore in that industry anymore because it's, mm. it's pretty wasteful to be honest. And um, it's much faster to be digital. And it um, makes sense. So I got so used to just being digital all the time, drawing digitally, and then sure. I found that it was much faster, at least for me. And you know, like in Eternal Smile, for example, I painted all in watercolor and it took forever. If I had actually done The Last Mermaid as, um, as with real watercolors, I think I'd still be working on it. It's <laughs> just so slow. That's fair. With like the, yeah, regular media. So uh, making it digital made it much faster. It's gorgeous. Folks, um, one thing I love in a story, and I'm saying this to you as well, Derek, I love when the protagonist is... Um, really on their back foot, you know, like, mm -hmm. like the, 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 the stakes are, are, are against them just in general. And I, I don't want to spoil anything yet, but the last mermaid, I mean, like it, it, a lot of it is the premise, you know, we've got a mermaid and she's clearly in a mech suit. She has to cross a post-apocalyptic Mad Max-esque Sandy desert. And I mean, what could be more dangerous for, uh, a, you know, a, a dweller of the sea? Exactly. Yeah. I saw in your notes in the back how when you were sort of like developing this, you know, it was basically mm -hmm. during the pandemic, you had a little more time to yourself. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like, what was the impetus for think for for for, you know, a mermaid and putting her in so much danger and, and, and <laughs> you know, like, or, or also just like, were, were there any specific influences? I'll, I'll try to specify my question. Were there any specific influences that inspired you to combine these sort of post-apocalyptic with something fantasy like mermaid um yeah uh even something as um seemingly unconnected as like little mermaid actually did i think have an influence on me because little mermaid was huge for me when i first saw it and chris you know we're like probably around the same age you probably remember at that time disney's films were like so bad and then little mermaid came out and it was like yeah. It was amazing. Huge creative resurgence for disney totally, totally that was incredible. that movie was a, a, an incredible step up from where they'd been Totally. And it blew me away. I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, whoa, this is a Disney movie. This is so good. So, and then I, I love movies like A Splash. 
is another yeah. uh, the, the Tom Hanks movie with the mermaid. So that's I've always cute. liked mermaid stories, but I've never seen a mermaid story that's sci-fi. You always see them either in a fantasy setting, a fairy tale setting, or a modern day setting, but you right. never see them in a sci-fi setting. So I thought, first of all, that's really cool. Um, but the original idea, and I, I've said this before a few times, so sorry if anybody here is boring anyone, but um, I saw this documentary or a news uh, coverage thing about Rumspringa. Yeah. Which is uh, that Amish tradition, if nobody knows, it's, a, it's an Amish tradition where they get to go out for a year and, um, and see the uh, outside world uh, for a year and come back to the Amish community. And then I, I don't know why or not. Just to be clear, like it, 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 it's their chance to see yes, the outside world, and 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 confirm that they want to be a member of their community. Or if not, good luck, you know. Yeah, exactly. But I don't know. This, this is how weird my mind is. The first thing before my mind was, what if mermaids had that? What if mermaids had one night where they could go into the surface world, see the surface world, and then they have to come back. And then I thought if, if they had to do that, they would need a machine that they would all use, each take a turn using. And right. It, and there would be this kind of like mech that they could walk out on the land with. So, so that was the um, one, one germ of the idea. And then, um, and then I always wanted to do a, a Mad Max is like one of my biggest influences, one of my favorite films. One of my okay. Favorite. So that was intentional to a degree, totally. like, like totally, the whole yeah. Sandy desert. I, I, I yeah. definitely got Mad Max vibes, but I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll let you go back to it. Yeah. Cool. For sure. And um, I always loved Mad Max. I always wanted to do a post-apocalyptic story. I also love this role-playing game called Gamma World. It's made by the same people as Dungeons and Dragons. Oh. But this role-playing game is set in a post-apocalyptic world where there's cybernetic animals, cybernetic people, there's mutants. Mm. Um, just It's just like everything a boy could want, you know, <laughs> like a 12-year-old could want. And I yeah. remember loving that role-playing game. And it's also very Mad Maxy, but it's like, it's like Mad Max on steroids, you know, because of all the extra things that are in it. And um, so I always wanted to do the post post apocalyptic story. Oh, yeah, Gamera fans. Yes. Apparently, a few people uh, definitely know that. <laughs> yes. Awesome. So I kind of wanted um, that. And then I was thinking, you know, when I was thinking of making a post apocalyptic story, I was like, what can I? It's been done so many times. Like, what can I do to make it different? And what can I do to make the stakes even worse? Because in a post-apocalyptic landscape, it's already so bad. But for a mer person, it'd be like hundred times worse because right. there's no water, right? Yeah. So, so that's why I thought it would be really cool to combine the two and, and have, a, have a story. I love it. I love it. You Thanks, know, uh, uh, thinking of animation, I love Ratatouille, and it's like, where is the place a rat would be least welcome? You know, in a, in a kitchen. <laughs> Exactly. It's like, where would be like the least hospitable environment for a mermaid? And, and you're putting her in there. Um, and she's just likable because she seems so innocent. She's got a little friend, uh, yeah. Lottie, that's swimming around in that like bubble with her. Is yeah. that like an axolotl or something like? Yeah. You know, what, what is this guy? It's an axolotl. It's yeah. Like, yeah. And it's it's very thing. cute. <laughs> I discovered them yeah, a few years ago. And I just thought they were just, they're like a living emoji smiling emoji it's crazy so um so i i had to use it and i wanted because the world is so dark and her situation so dire i felt like they needed some spark of light in there and you know lottie serves that purpose i think that's cool i like that i like that let me loop back to something i started talking about which is um how you've been able to play with format because you did webcams, you've done traditional comics in some styles, and we talked slightly about this at the convention. But if we look at this, just to be clear, folks, look at that. That is a square comic, roughly. That is that that is not, you know, for instance, the standard sort of size. This is this is square, and I I just thought it was interesting. Would you be willing to share a little bit about how you ended up in that sort of format? I think yeah. it works, but I'd love oh, to, cool. to share that. Thanks, Chris. I'm actually kind of nervous about that because I heard a lot of stores. It's a hassle for them to um, to to shelve that. But um, it, it wasn't it wasn't to drive them crazy or anything. I, it was just purely a um, me just coming from film uh, and then back to comics. Because what happened was um, during the pandemic uh, when it first started, um, I did, I wanted to uh, <laughs> a lot of Axelon fans. Awesome people like Axelon. Uh, uh, who, who, how can you not like an Axelon? It's impossible. Very cute. Yeah, but. Um, I started it actually as a as a storyboard just for fun. I wanted to do storyboards just for myself, so I started it in that sixteen by nine format that we had at work. Um, we used a program called Storyboard Pro, and, and you know it's like those uh, ratios are already built in. So Got I just it. started doing working on that, and then I just kept going on the story. And then um, 
uh, after a while, I did four parts as an animatic, which take forever because you have to kind of animate them a Just little bit. Just give people an idea of the sort of like, yeah, square, well, more rectangular format that like, but, right. You, I, I didn't mean to talk over you, but like, obviously you know, that wouldn't quite have been easy to adapt into the standard totally. dimensions. So, but you did an animatic? Yeah, so I did an animatic. You can see it on my YouTube page or uh, Instagram page. And it's uh, I did four parts. It only goes up to about the half the first issue, but it has sound. Uh, it has music and um, and uh, voices and but just it's storyboard format, so the art's not like all painted. But you know you, you can like watch it and listen to it. But uh, after a while, it was taking up all my time. And then at a certain point, I was like, I can't make money. I can't I can't just keep living off of uh, likes, you know. So um, so I decided, okay, let's make this into a comic, and I'll pitch it to Image. Um, but by that point, I had already done so much work in that sixteen by nine. I tried to fit it into a comic page and the panels became like so tiny. It was like, really yeah. Hard to see. So yeah. I was like, unless I like reformat every single panel, I'm going to have to like widen it. So that was the only reason why I did this format this way. It wasn't any grand design idea or anything. Yeah. Uh, I like it, but then of course, maybe I'm, I'm biased towards liking something that's a little off the beaten page. I like seeing people play with the medium of comics to see what it can do. For me, I thought it read very nicely, actually. I think it works very well. Uh, oh, cool. Awesome. But um, yeah, and by the way, because of this sort of slightly longer format, folks, I'm just going to hint at this, but like you get some double page splashes that really set the scene in a very um, cinematic way, to be honest. And and that's yeah. that that's a nice thing sometimes. Oh, cool. Uh, yes. I'm excited to see where it goes. I can't. Uh, I'm excited to show you. I I, I I really value your opinion and watching all the uh, the reviews. So um, I, yeah, I would love to know what you think. I, I'm I I. I I try to be very honest with my opinions on this yep. show and mm -hmm. I sincerely liked it. Um, oh, cool. Image uh, sends me uh, PDFs folks like preview things. Um, oh, cool. I'm sure they send them. So, so I had seen this, but um, it was really nice to hold in my hands. It's, I think it's a great presentation. Um, cool. I wanted to have you on because I, it, folks, just to be clear, comes out this Wednesday. So this That's is right. this week. This yep. is this week. And, you know, uh, Image Comics, so that I'm happy for you. Uh, Thanks so much, yeah. Now you're back in comics. Like, can we expect you to, to, to develop any more ideas in comics? Or is it yes. going to be for now just like Last Mermaid and then we have to be patient or what? <laughs> as long as um, I can keep, you know, making a living. I mean, I'm happy yeah. to just be in, the com in comics for some of my life. I'm, I'm so happy to be back in comics and telling my own stories again. And and Chris, when I when I discovered your your videos and I was watching them a lot while I was drawing, it really reignited my love of comics again. And and I think wow. you do that for a lot of people. And um, it it really like inspired me and kept me going. And um, and just yeah, it just made me remember like what I originally started doing this for in the first place. You know what I mean? Those feelings that you get that we got reading those comics that you're reviewing. That, that's the same kind of feelings that I wanted to present to the next you know generation. So. Thank yeah. you. I will. I will accept the compliment. As I get older, I, I've learned not to deflect all that stuff that you need to like. You know, yeah. value the person's uh, opinion. That's really, really kind of you, though. I, I'm, I'm also, humbled. Also, um, um, this was great entertainment too. Like I remember the. I think the first one I found was the one where you were eating the chili peppers for every show. <laughs> it was early on. Yeah, and I'm like, I was. Exp I was playing with the format. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just talking about what we do. I was playing exactly. with the format back then. And I've never seen any comics video like that. <laughs> and so uh, eye catching, and then I remember the one where you started taking shots, and I was yeah. genuinely scared for you in that video. You were getting more and more drunk, and by the end, your words were slurring, and oh my god, it was. Amazing. I know. So <laughs> let let me let some folks in behind the scenes because I phased that out because a lot of people were, were like, you know, like. Oh, you're drinking too much, Chris. I worry about you. Also, mm -hmm. like people saying, like, you know, hey, you're gonna like influence others. And I was like, okay, just uh, to be clear, I was doing it more as like a gag. And when I was like having those shots, I wasn't actually always drinking all of it. I was ha I usually right. had alcohol there, but I wasn't like having as much as it sort of implies on, oh, okay. on the show. Just were you, were it was you acting and then spitting? Were you spitting? Not spitting so much as like oh, sometimes yeah. like um I'd like take like half the shot and, 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 and the shot cuts. If you look closely, you could, if you don't oh, see me okay. like literally drinking it, okay. I wasn't is okay, okay. all I can sort of say. So, but like, That's I thought about that after a while and I was like, 
I think it's funny if someone like gets a little buzzed. I really did get buzzed once or twice <laughs> in the know. early things to give sort of um an unfiltered opinion. Uh -huh. And then I started like going like, well, maybe I'm not like, you know, I don't know if I want this to also be my gimmick that like every single right. week I'm drinking. <laughs> like that, that gets dangerous. That gets dangerous. You. You. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Derek. Um, yeah. And also, I just want to mention one last thing, Chris, that, that, that part where you got stuck in the stairwell, I, was, <laughs> I felt so bad for you. And it was such a, yeah situation i've never seen that before it was so Yo, funny that was that was real folks uh so yeah. uh, it was like was out of at, a 30 rock episode or something it was, I, really it, was it was at emerald city comic-con which we just both oh, that's went to, right. that, was, but it was in the yeah, old yeah. building that they had God, it was God. like two years ago maybe yeah, yeah. and i was excited because uh i really like daniel warren johnson and he was going He's to there. do a limited number of like sort of commissions i forget what he called them but like sketches for like the first few people that that showed up and i knew that it would be popular and i'm like i better be clever i'm gonna go up the back stairwell and i'll get up before like everybody going on the escalator oh, that's okay. and instead folks i went into like the stairwell the doors lock behind you there's no air conditioning it, i was sweltering and i'm like pounding on the door and no one answers because it's these thick steel oh, doors man. they're like yeah. super thick no one could hear i had oh to call the convention center and they had to send a security guard <laughs> to get me out i was so embarrassed i cost oh, myself man. a lot of time that was crazy man that was so crazy thank you for bringing that back yeah. though because i i now that time has passed that's like that that cracks me up that i did that <laughs> yeah <laughs> not smart I, I always worry about that now when I go to convention. I'm like, don't go through any doors. Just take the elevator. <laughs> Stay with the crowds, yeah. folks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to get trapped. Um, that's so exciting. Do you exactly. have any other conventions or anything planned for, for 2024? Um, yes. Uh, I'm trying to do as many conventions as I can. Um, I'm going to do uh, Chicago next, C2E2. Great. Um, the same people that run uh, Emerald City Comic Con. I was yep. kind of kind enough to let me come to, yeah, read. Uh, kind enough to let me come to Chicago, and then I'm going to yeah, try to go to New York, New York Comic Con. Which you I are going to be at New York? Too. I'm going to go. I mean, I don't know if they're. I always me, go to New York. Right, even if they don't have me, I'll go. And, and I've never been. I've never been. So. I really oh really? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a spectacle. I mean, I'm, yeah. have you gone to San Diego before? Of course, I've been to Chicago. Yeah. I've been going to it, San Diego. It, since it's it's a huge huge scale. So it's sort of like. I don't know about you. I love some of the indie comic cons like mm -hmm. small press expo and, and, and things like Mocha and ape. I love those because it's intimate and you get to have like some conversations and discover new things, but sometimes it is fun to go to the gigantic conventions because oh, yeah. it's like the, the cosplay and like, you know, all, yeah. all the big names come out. Yeah. It's fun. I love, I love both too. It used to be when I was younger, I was kind of more veered toward the, art, uh, the artsy ones, but nowadays, now that I'm older, I, I love all of it. I love everything. You know, I just love the enthusiasm and um, the, there's no pretension, you know, at the big ones, like everyone's just geeking out and yeah, you know, I, I love that energy. It's, it's, it's great. I love it. So Chicago and New York, we, we can oh, probably yeah, Chicago expect and New York. you at. Um, um, I did talk to Fan Expo for Denver, so I'm going to be at Denver and um i'm gonna try to go to baltimore my brother lives in baltimore so. oh that would be great that's yeah. a really nice convention i lived in yeah. dc for like 10 years and i, I would oh, wow. go to baltimore baltimore puts on a really lovely convention where it's like big but the focus i feel has always remained very much on comics that's what i heard it's it's just very comics centric which is great that's um so cool and um oh is it, and of course san diego i've been going to san diego since i was like a young teenager like early teen maybe actually maybe even in grade school because my grandma lived in san diego and it was a big fun trip every year uh, yeah, cool. uh we would go to grand visit my grandma and then we would me and my brother and then we would go to uh san diego comic con and then, <laughs> yeah those are those are great times and then of course san diego uh Oh, crazy. look at that. Yeah, Jim Mafood yeah. says that he'll he'll be in New York too and he'd love to say hi. That's yeah, I'd love to meet you, man. I love your work. Thank you so much. Jim's a great guy. Yeah, he seems like it. Uh, um, and also, to answer your previous question about uh, being in comics, uh, yeah. actually, I actually have another comic already um, signed up with Image and it'll be coming out early uh, next year in April. Really? And it's called Royals and it's a standalone graphic novel. And and Chris, I'm actually really curious what you're going to think because I know you love crime, crime comics. I do. And, and it's my first uh, crime uh, keeper. And, okay. Uh, 
It's about uh, a twin brothers who are telepathically connected, and they use their power to um, call on poker games, and then and then they get caught, and it's, it's it, everything goes to crap. And uh, <laughs> and I'm really excited about it. And I got this artist name, um, and artist uh, Jacob Perez is going to be drawing it, and he is a phenomenal artist. Check out his Instagram. You can check okay. out uh, the sample of uh, Royals we put up. Um, on my Instagram and on, on his as well. And um, it takes place in Seoul. And he just, he just, it's like you're there the way you do Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. I'd love to visit like uh, Seoul, but yeah, like uh, that, that's so exciting. I do yeah. love crime comics. So yes, I, I'm uh, like, you, you tell me the premise. I'm already uh, fairly intrigued. I, I, I enjoy, you know, like the poker sort of movies too. Um, yeah, and too. and that, there was that book about the MIT students that were like counting cards. I forget yes. the title of the book now. Um, Ah, uh, yeah, and it was also made into a movie. Twenty one, I guess, or um... I think it was something like that. Anyway, yeah, it was yeah. good. It was yeah, a yeah, real yeah. life story, folks. They were going to like, um, uh, yeah, they were MIT students. They would go down to uh, Atlantic City, and and, and yeah. they were, these were all mathematicians that were using yeah. their big brains. <laughs> Poker is like the one game that you can um, legit like have an edge over the house if you practice. That's true. Depending on how many shoot uh, decks they pull out. But um, mm -hmm. that's an interesting uh, wrinkle, adding telepathy. I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely intrigued. That's exciting. Oh, that's cool. And so you're, cool. you're writing that one. Yes. With and what was the artist's name? One more time. Artist name is Jacob Perez, and it's actually his first uh, graphic novel. But um, he's done a lot of work in animation. He, he actually does um, the character designs on the new Ninja Turtles show that's coming out. Um, wow. Based, based, based on the recent movie, and um, yeah, he's a phenomenal artist and. Uh, I can't believe this is his first comic. It's so good. It, the the pages are so good. I can't wait for you to see it. Oh wow! Yeah, but he's got. He just he's told me like things. I was saying poker. I I definitely obviously meant blackjack. Folks are correcting me. What, oh, what right, I was right, saying. Right. That that's that's, that's, that's what I'm getting wrong. But you're saying yeah. they play poker. I was yeah, conflating yeah. it with blackjack. I, yeah, I, yeah. I'm an idiot. I've ruined the interview. <laughs> I've ruined the interview. We were having I such a good vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ruined. Hey, I didn't. I didn't catch it either. So you can't blame yourself, Chris. Yeah. Yeah, I blame, I shared blame responsibility. This is this is our, both of our shows. Half the <laughs> half the half the fault is this guy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Totally. Um, where can uh, folks uh, keep up with you? Because I know you've got a few social channels, but like that would probably be a good way to you know like for them to to catch up on you know your your upcoming books and stuff. What 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 channels do you want to mention? Yeah, actually, all I have is uh, Instagram and Threads. I just recently joined Threads. I don't know. It doesn't seem like a lot of people use it, but I'm on both of those things. There's a good comics community on Threads is what I'll oh, say. Okay. You're right. Oh. Like, it's not like a massive sort of amount of people like Twitter, but I think it's a little more positive so far. Oh, Threads. cool. That's great to hear. That's, That's one what of the I'm reasons seeing. I avoid Twitter, so... Yeah. And 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 it's just Derek Kirk Kim, right? On um, right. Insta and Threads? Yep. It's just my name, Derek Kirk Kim. Yep. And then you've got like the, uh, you said you uploaded to YouTube the animatic, right? Yeah, there's four parts of The Last Mermaid. The animatic version is up there. Yeah, yeah. I'll uh -huh. put that in the description, folks, once I wrap up the show, just so that you've got an easy uh, link to use. Thank Derek, you, thank you for, for the kind words, but like, um, thank you also for like, you know, just sharing uh, some of uh, this history with you. I'd love to keep in touch and, and, and see uh, what, what happens by the time um, Last Mermaid uh, wraps up and, and Royals uh, starts up. That would be really um, nice. Oh, speaking of which, uh, Last Mermaid is probably going to go about 25 to 30 issues. Uh, granted, the sales are okay. Oh, so this is a big, bigger story than I realized. Yeah, yeah. No yeah, kidding. Thank you for adding that. I honestly yeah. was thinking this was like a shorter term uh, sort of oh. thing. Oh, so you've got oh. a big, you've got a big world to, to, to flesh out here. Oh yeah. It's a, it's a pretty big, it's like the, the biggest thing I've tackled so far. And I'm really excited to, 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 to hopefully get to the end this time. I, I really hope. That. I hope so. I, I hope so. I, I, I you know, I, I, we do comic quick, like reviews here and, and sometimes things lose me um, even when I respect the creators, but so far I absolutely really love it. And, and, and I'm glad Thanks. that you were able to swing by and, and talk about it with us. Oh, thanks so much, Chris. Really appreciate uh, being here. And uh, I, I'm such a fan. It's so cool just to be on this side. <laughs> it's, I'm a fan too. So, so it's mutual yeah. and, um, and, and just feel better. Cause I know you said you were feeling like congested or something. So, so feel better, but thank you so much, uh, Derek, uh, on behalf of all of us here in the chat. Like I can see a lot of positive comments. Thank you so oh, much for your time today. Thank you, Chris. And thank you everybody watching. I, I, I actually joined you once live just watching and I, I thank there's you. many nice people in there. So I devil salute. All of you. Thank you. Double salute.
Oh. Thank you, Derek. Take okay. care. Have a great Thanks night. Chris. Okay, bye. Bye. Wow. Um, that was a lot of fun for me. I I enjoy interviews. Uh, and at the same time, I want to be a good host. I want to like ask them things that hopefully they haven't been asked a million times before. Uh, oh, there's the, you know, it, it requires a little prep. Oh, hold on. Uh, oh, look, su tons of super nice things. Um, I can't catch them all. Wow. You guys are great. Um, thank you for making this a positive environment to everybody in the chat. That's really, really nice. And um, pure class. He is, isn't he? It's been really nice uh, getting to talk to him lately. Uh, look at this. Let's see. A super chat. Thank you. Hey, Chris and Derek. Hope you're both been doing well tonight. Finally got a job offer. So I'm pretty excited. Well, we're very happy for you, Powerhouse. Thank you for the super chat. That's sincerely appreciated. Um, tell you what, folks. Uh I'll I'll follow up on something a, a little bit related is uh I got to see Derek I, I said at Emerald City Comic Con so I just uh had a few photos and I thought I'd do a super quick recap of what I did at the convention and then we'll go into the news so uh yeah I'm in the Seattle area and so I went to Emerald City Comic Con and one nice thing about it thank you everyone uh it feels like it's starting to return a little bit more to the versions of the conventions that we saw pre pandemic. Um, that, that will definitely be a, uh, a thing. We'll, I think all use as a, um, reference point. Uh, how can we not, you know? And, uh, so I took just a few photos. I thought I'd show you, uh, it was a nice event. It had some great guests. Um, I put this up on my Patreon, but i made it like, um, for, for everybody, like including free members. I got to meet like just, just a few, uh, nice people. I, I had a nice little conversation with Mark Russell. Um, I, I think you guys remember, I really enjoyed Superman space age, but I also got his fun comic, uh, serial through Ahoy Comics, which is basically taking those um, serial monsters like Count Chocula and stuff and putting it in a, a slightly more real world, which is hilarious. Um, uh, oh, Jim Zub, I got to have some nice conversations with. I'm so happy to see his Conan book doing well. It's as good as Conan has ever been. If you're into like sword and sorcery stuff, Conan right now, as good as it's ever been. And easy to jump on now that it's at a new publisher. Uh, my friend Kyle Higgins surprised me. He didn't table, but his um, girlfriend Kelly McMahon was there. And so uh, Kyle and I got some time to uh, talk about what's coming up. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about one of his comics when we do the reviews in a bit. Thank you, Steve. Mark Russell rules. Met him at New York Comic Con. He, he's got some really innovative ideas for, for comics. You know, he thinks outside the box. I will say that. Yes, uh, Conan is now at uh, Titan. Uh, although Jim wrote it at Marvel, he um, is also writing it here, but it's a, like a fresh jumping on point. It's not like it's rebooting everything, but it's a very easy, fresh jumping on point if you've never um, read any of that. Oh, wow. Thank you for the generous super chat, ND and Omni. My local comic sh shop, which is Famous Faces and Funnies in Florida just had their 30th anniversary this weekend. They had Robert Kirkman via Skype for an interview. Oh, that's so cool. It was super cool. I wanted to give my LCS a shout out. Well, congrats to your uh, LCS. That's really nice to hear. Uh, who else? Um, oh, there's Derek. There's Derek. Um, he had obviously uh, a bunch of Last Mermaid to debut there. Again, that comes out this Wednesday. To, to, it comes out this week. That's why I decided to have him on. And um, I got to see Eric Powell. I think we all know the goon, but one that I would really recommend uh, that Eric did was uh, uh, just over a year ago. Um, did you hear what Eddie Gein done? Which is done with true crime writer Harold Schechter. And they are working again on an upcoming graphic novel that should be out pretty soon about Dr. Frederick Wortham, who a lot of us will remember, Seduction of the Innocent, really condemned comics in the 50s. Um, I got to speak quite a bit to Jimmy Pomiati 
and uh, met his wife, Amanda Connor, as well, uh, briefly. And uh, uh, don't be surprised if Jimmy uh, shows up on the show sometime soon. I've been really impressed with how um, Jimmy has transitioned into doing a lot of successful crowdfunding campaigns for his books. Good for him. You know, he, he's securing them bags at this point and uh, good for him. I got to have a lovely conversation with Zoe Thorogood. Um, I discovered her book, Lonely at the Center of the Earth, a little later than most people, but it really is a spectacular autobiography that deals with some um, serious mental health issues, but is also just a fascinating comic book story and plays with the format. And she's just a brilliant artist. So I didn't have this book yet. Um, I picked up the impending blindness of Billy Scott that she did. She, by the way, uh, Zoe was the only person hip enough to know that I was the, that the, the, um, brand of sweatshirt that I'm wearing was Teddy fresh. She goes, Oh, cool. Teddy fresh. Uh, <laughs> Zoe is a lot younger and hipper than me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm fascinated to see what the book about Dr. Frederick Wortham will be. Uh, I love Zoe and her work is so unique and robust. She's really, she's really got a lot of special stuff. Uh, and yeah, she's she's going to continue, I think, to make a big uh, impact. I saw just here's a little of the cosplay that I saw that I liked. Uh, Venom and a uh, Agent Anti-Venom. So I liked that. I thought that that was very well done. Um Cloud Strife. I just, wow, this guy nailed it. A lot of, lot of attention to detail with all of that. Uh, this guy as Beast really amused me. He was wearing like these cool flip-flops that were painted the same blue. And I thought he was doing a great job. Um, here was a, an Usagi Yojimbo. I don't think that that's a cosplay you get to see too often, but I thought that, that was really impressive. Thank you, Chi-Chi. Caught Trash Movie Bonanza over the weekend, and it was a blast. Can't wait for the next episode. Yeah, um, not many people have seen it, but I did share it with uh, some of my patrons. Uh, that is the show Jim and I, uh, Jim Mafood and I are making. Um, and what am I wearing today? Let me uh, share that with you. We, we already have merch ready to go as soon as we launch this show for everybody, folks. Trash Movie Bonanza. That's going to be Jim and I talking about the schlocky shitty movies that we just absolutely love. Um, so that is coming very, very soon, very, very soon. Um, I did let my patrons, uh, have access to it early. Look at that. Look at that shirt. Yes. As soon as we launch it, there will be links so that you can buy one yourself. Um, but Jim obviously has a bunch of merch. If you uh, go to his website, you can like get his link to his T public stuff. Yes, it is definitely my food art. Um, let's see. Um, I'm almost done with the, the little recap I had here. And that was, I think the last one I've got like posted was I just, you know, Joker. Yeah, we've seen it a bunch, but that's a really well done one. I thought that's, that's sort of killing joke Joker. I thought, but anyway, I just wanted to share some of that. Uh, let me add, um, ba -ba 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 -ba, the news. Let's get into the news. There's a lot to talk about there. And not all of it is negative, even though I sort of played with it in this thumbnail. I'm playing that game. I'm playing that views game. Uh, let's see. So this one's positive, for instance. Uh, Marvel must have free comics, folks. They're really like not just free comic book day. We are talking Marvel is making comics that will be free to get you into, obviously, like reading the whole series. But still, uh, let's see. So uh, this week, Marvel's going to release their first one. It's uh, going to have three comics in it. It's over 80 pages. It's pretty, pretty good value for free, right? <laughs> uh, this is what the first issue collects. It's got 2016's Spider-Man Deadpool issue one. Uh, this year, this past year's uh, Immortal Thor number two and uh, last year's Ms. Marvel, the new mutant number one. So obviously the goal is to uh, interest you so that you want to like, you know, pick up the trade or the issues or something like that, which is totally fair, I think. 
Uh, but you know what? It's free. And I think that that's a good tool for comic book stores. So I was kind of impressed that Marvel, uh, and they apparently plan to do more of these. They're going to call that. This is what it's going to be branded as Marvel must haves. Uh, pretty nice to, for, for comic book shops though. You know, uh, the first taste is free, but the next hit will cost you no question. They're not, <laughs> let's see. It's really funny that they include the second issue of immortal Thor and not issue one. Um, yeah, I, I think you're right. The first issue is oversized, but you know, I think it still gets the premise across. I don't do drugs. I buy comics. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Look, it's marketing, but um, I'm always glad to see publishers invest in something like this to get potentially new readers or at least existing readers to come back. Uh, so, you know, I, I hope it works. I hope it works. We will say it's an interesting idea to, to play with. Um, it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea. I, I like the idea. I, I, I want it to work. We'll see. <laughs> Still Marvel stuff, but oh my God, did actor Ray Winstone not like working on Black Widow to the degree that it becomes hilarious. So uh, if you didn't see it or just need to be reminded, he played the villain uh, Drakov in, in the Black Widow movie. Um, sort of like, you know, a Russian KGB guy that ran the Red Room that, that produced Black Widow. Um, he's got Taskmaster working for him. This, this past week, he did an interview with Radio Times. That's a British publication. Uh, and he <laughs> intimated that he hated coming back for the reshoots specifically. Listen to this quote. It was fine until you have to do the reshoots. Then you find out that a few producers have come down and your performance is too much. It's too strong. Sure, right? <laughs> uh, that's the way Marvel works. It can be soul destroying because you feel like you're doing great work. I actually said, you ought to recast it because that was it for me. And you end up doing it again because you're contracted to do it. Otherwise, you end up in court. It's like being kicked in the balls. It's like being kicked in the balls. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. He really did not like doing that movie, did he? <laughs> yes, I like that. Uh, cow a bummer. Cow a bummer. Oh, my goodness. Black Widow definitely falls towards the lower end of the MCU movies. There are there are some fun action sequences in it. I thought Scarlett Johansson did as good as she could with the material, but they probably could have done with maybe just another rewrite or something like that. Taskmaster is a good villain. The Red Room was interesting to explore. I loved Yelena Belova, right? I think a lot of us loved Florence Pugh in the MCU. That was that was the biggest part. Is it Well, you know what? I say that and um then again, like also uh her whole family, Red Guardian and Melina, there, there was some good stuff. There was. The villain was on the weaker end. The villain was on the weaker end out of like the, the MCU movies. But I just I just thought this was funny because he literally says it's like being kicked in the balls. Oh, my God. That's so harsh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know exactly what he means by like saying that his performance was too good, that it was too strong. I'm like, I don't know if you're allowed to say that about your own performance, but whatever. Obviously, he liked what he was doing and, and they need to redo some of it. All right. Moving on, though. Uh is there going to be a spider women movie at Sony? Just to be clear, this is just a comic book that I'm using because this is more of a rumor. So there's no real art to go with it. Um, this comes from Daniel Rickman. Daniel RPK uh, does lots of Hollywood scoops and stuff. Uh, he said that Sony is looking to develop two new animated films. I definitely would believe that since the one thing Sony does get good response on is their spider verse movies. Uh, it's certainly not Madam Web and Morbius, but their animated stuff are pretty fantastic. So the goal is one would be focused on Spider-Man's rogues gallery. 
that doesn't sound like a good idea to me. Uh, and the second would be with a female lead, presumably one of the spider women, I guess. Let's see. EJ, always good to see you. Maybe Black Widow actually beat him up. Yes, in real life, she beat up uh, Ray Winstone and, and, and it, it soured him. He didn't like it. <laughs> when he says it was like being kicked in the balls, I, maybe he meant that he was literally kicked in the balls on set. Maybe that's what he meant. But anyway, um, uh, even though they said that they'd be doing one with a female lead, uh, this is separate, apparently, from the Spider-Woman movie that Sony announced they would make back in 2018, which I guess they're still developing. The 2018 one, Amy Pascal, she's a producer on all the movies, former head of Sony. Um, she said that the Spider-Woman movie in 2018 will have Spider-Gwen, uh, Silk, and the Jessica Drew Spider-Woman. Uh, I don't know. You know... Off the top of my head, that doesn't necessarily sound like a winning formula, but the Spider-Verse movies are pretty great. So if they get like, you know, a really great team behind it, cool. I'm all in. I'm all in. Oh, that's a good point. Miguel, you know what? You, 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 you've you turned me around because if you folks haven't read the uh, Nick Spencer, uh, Steve Lieber book, Superior Foes of Spider-Man... That actually is a fantastic story. I guess when I read this, I'm thinking that they're going to just, you know, have the Sinister Six exist without Spider-Man. But Superior Foes is actually a really funny, good comic that stands on its own. That's a good point. That's a good point. We'll see. We'll see. They pulled Madam Web from the cinemas early over here. This is what they do when Superhood drops a clanger. Dude, I mean, Sydney Sweeney hosted SNL this past week. No doubt that was to promote Madam Web, but it bombed so hard that mostly she was promoting that like romantic comedy she made like a month ago with Glenn Powell. I I I think it's called like Anyone But You. Like she's like, you may have seen me in Euphoria or anyone but you. You certainly didn't see me in Madam Web. I was like, okay, <laughs> Sydney is already burying a movie that's only been out like two weeks. <laughs> it was kind of funny. I don't know Emissaries of Evil, actually. But if you are going to go see a movie, I'm not going to say anything about it, but I thought Dune 2 was pretty great. Uh, let's go back to comic book news. The new leaders of X-Men have been revealed. And how have they been revealed? By Madam Web. See, it's all planned out, folks. Everything is a segue into something else. I'm, I, I just put that much thought into this. Or maybe it's a happy coincidence. Who can say? Uh, so there was a book uh, this past week called Women of Marvel, number one, sort of an anthology uh, series. Uh, obviously, designed for, because we are now in women's history month cool fine with that uh and it says it, it had a scene where madam webb looks into the future and i'm only showing like a little portion of it but it revealed the leaders of the x-men teams that are coming up um we've got a scene where rogue is leading one team and kate pride is leading the others there's, a, there's pretty much always two X-Men teams these days. Uh, also in that book, writer Angelique Roche wrote, Rogue and Kate Pride will each be leading a new X-Men team. More to come as details on the summer 2024 X-Men launches are released. Um, at first, I'm like, I, I, I feel like the Kate Pride one makes a lot more sense. You know, she's led the Marauders. She's definitely gone on a growth arc over many, many years. Rogue doesn't make as much sense, but you know what? At first, neither did Storm when she became the leader. And Storm is like probably Marvel's best female character. She's awesome. Dune 2 was enjoyable and life-affirmingly good. 100 out of 10. Well, there you go, folks. There you go. Rogue and Kitty, I'm happy about that. Yep. It is rumored that Gail Simone is, is headlining uh, at least one of the X-Men books. Yes. If she's writing the new mainline X-Men where Rogue is the leader, I'd be down with that. Not sure what the plan with Kitty is, though. I don't know. I don't know. 
Yeah, there probably is going to be a major reset before these books come out. Like, just to be clear, if you haven't like kept up with the Krakoa era, you know, there, there, there is, there's literally potential to reset a timeline, um, which could have some lasting effects. But there, there could be basically a, um, a big reboot. We'll see. Oh, I guess that's it for X Men. Uh, this one was just sort of a fun nonsense. I mean. This is how these event books hook you is like the title and the, and the promotional art look interesting. And then they're like, and it's only 52 issues. I'm like, Oh, that's, that's a little more than I want to get into, but Marvel is going to have venom war this summer. Okay. What's venom war. So they've got this teaser image here with art by Philip Tan. Philip Tan is not the regular artist of the book. That will be, excuse me. I'm hiccuping Ibn Coelho. And it appears to indicate that we've got Eddie Brock versus his son, Dylan, battling each other. And they've got other symbiotes in here. We've got Red Goblin. We've got Agent Anti-Venom, Black Widow's Venom, Roboto, etc. I don't know them all. I can't keep up. I can't keep up. <laughs> It doesn't feel like it's been that long since the last symbiote crossover, but we can at least rest easy because there doesn't seem to be carnage in there. No carnage. Look at that. Very excited for this. Venom has been cooking, and I love Ibn's art. Ibn's, Ibn's good, and I do like a lot of what um, Al Ewing has done in the past. Uh, the I liked the um, Donny Cates era of Venom, and then... I stayed with Venom because I like Brian Hitch's art, but the story sort of started to lose me. Um, so we'll see. Maybe this will bring it back. Yeah, I feel like he quietly moved on from Fantastic Four, but I'm not sure. I never saw a press release or anything. Uh, because her name's Black Widow and she didn't have spider powers and now she does. Doi. A doy. Uh, hate is coming back. So let's get into the indie stuff for a minute here. I don't know how many of you read hate, but it was definitely uh, of the moment. Uh, indie Gen X angst, uh, full of dum dums. Buddy Bradley made lots of bad decisions. Well, it's coming back. Uh, so yeah, '90s hit by Peter Baggy. Uh, Fantagraphics uh, published it. They're bringing it back for a limited series. It followed the original characters in grunge era Seattle. So in my neck of the woods. Um, it's going to be a four issue limited series this June. It's called Hate Revisited. As far as what it offers, it's going to have characters like Buddy, Lisa, their various friends uh, dealing with things like parenthood, uh, loss, you know, like Buddy has never really dealt with uh, the fact that his friend Stinky died. They're going to finally have him many years later dealing with that trauma. Um, and they'll also have flashbacks to their Gen X days when they first met. So they'll fill in some of the blanks there. If you haven't read it, um, it's pretty good. Buddy Bradley is the Scott Pilgrim of the 90s. I think that that's very fair. I think that's a very fair assessment. It's not for everybody. Um, you know, it's, it, the, the, the jokes are definitely like kind of off color and stuff, but it really captured, uh, that era in a very real way. It really did. So I'm curious. I'm definitely curious. Skybound, uh, has done a couple things with universal monsters. We see that branding up here. They've got the Dracula book that's still going on by, um, Ty Tynan and um, oh, who's the artist? Martin Simmons, where they're focusing a little bit more on some of the supporting cast from that. We've got the announced Creature of the Black Lagoon with artist uh, Matt Roberts uh, sort of doing a sequel. And then we've got this, their take on Frankenstein. And I like some of this. Yes, exactly cool art. Exactly. I think some people here will really like this. Michael Walsh from Silvercoin. Silvercoin is definitely a really acclaimed um, horror title. Well, writer-artist Michael Walsh is making this book 
Frankenstein. Uh, it's going to come out August 24th. And the idea on this one is that each issue is going to give us the backstory on one of the body parts that were used to create Dr. Frankenstein's monster. So Dr. Frankenstein is basically, you know, going to be grave robbing and we're going to learn the story of the people that like assembled his monster. That's a cool idea. Nope. Can't go wrong on with uh Walsh on horror, Matt Roberts creature snippets. He's been putting on social media have been terrific. I so agree, Matt, Mike, um, you know, we're, we're biased. We like Matt Roberts art and stuff, but I think he's a, I think he's a really good fit for that book. I think that'll be really cool. I love the creature, his design. I love it. Oh, I was wondering uh, where we all knew you from Kevin. That's, that's really nice. Oh, I bet they will get to the mummy. I don't know who the creative team will be, but they've been hiring some really creative people. I'm really good with my deep vocabulary. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. No question, Adolfo. Uh, will this finally be the adaptation to remember that the monster's name is Adam? Who knows? You mean he's not named Frankenstein? Oh, that's true, Wolfman. There's a lot of great universal monsters that are um, a little lesser known, but uh, could be a lot of fun. You know what I need to get back into? I need to get back into looking at the Hammer horror films of the 50s through the 70s. You know, like their their Christopher Lee, uh, Dracula stuff, and 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 get into like their more obscure horror movies like Reptile and stuff. Maybe that would be potentially something Jim and I could talk about on um, Trash Movie Bonanza. There's got to be one or two that are like uh, more of cult hits than like big hits. Well, I, I got to think about it. I got to think about it. Hammer was cool because the universal stuff was great, but it was all black and white. And, you know, Hammer was up to the moment. It used its color palette with lots of blood, lots of sexy ladies, the cheapest special effect, but an effective one. <laughs> cleavage, lots of cleavage, just to be clear. I've seen um, clips of the Mexican uh, version of Dracula that they shot at the same time as the original one. Uh, but I've never watched the whole movie. Oh, I'm looking forward to it too, EJ. I'm looking forward to it too. The Hammer Anthology series is really cool too. Yeah, I don't think I know that too much. Oh, I've never seen The Gorgon, but that's the kind of thing I'm talking about that I should dig into. That's what I should dig into. All right. Um, what is Rip Ascend, folks? Uh, I think if you're into comics you've probably been exposed on some level to Eric July, but let me talk about this because whether we're fans or not, I think it's hard to ignore the success that Eric July uh, experiences when he makes comics. So I thought it was worthy of uh, just at least bringing up here in the news. So who is he? If you don't know, he's a far right YouTuber. Um, he's got, you know, a very loyal following, a very big following. He started his own comic book line this last July with uh, Isom number one. He sold it crowdfunding style through his own site. Made a, a lot of money. Yes, I agree. The uh, the logo, uh, they, they should have given a little bit more thought to that D because that definitely looks like an O. It's just way too rounded. It needs to come down just a little bit more over here just needs to but rip a rip a seno rip a seno uh no isom did uh settle that lawsuit with the uh the church that also uses that like the international school of ministries i want to say they, they settled that lawsuit out of court uh so anyway so so he's made his comics he does a crowdfunding he runs crowdfunding on his own site as compared to through you know like kickstarter or something like that uh this or indiegogo this week he announced that he's launching this rip ascend which will allow other people to get access to the tools that he's built on his website so eric called it a um a comprehensive service provider specializing in publishing distribution and fulfillment you know, if you're a huge fan of him and you want to make comics, then I, I'm sure that that sounds really exciting. Uh, to me, it sounds like it's super similar to like Zoop, where it can sort of like customize how you um, offer fulfillment and stuff. 
Uh, but there's no word on the margins. Like, I don't know, you know, like, are they going to have to charge more or less than other crowdfunding platforms? I really would have no idea what the scale is on something like this. I have no idea. Presumably, this is my presumption, the advantage to using it would be to talk to folks with similar political views that are ready to support each other's comics. I, I Other than that, I don't know why you'd want to use this particular service. It, I, I didn't see them say anything about how you could make more money or have access to more people than, say, something like Zoop or Kickstarter, etc. So I don't know. Yeah, I think Zoop is doing some incredible things with comics, no question. And they really find ways to customize the rewards and fulfillment for each project. I, I'm really impressed with Zoop. I don't know what to make of this, but yeah. Uh, Red Isom number one wasn't impressed, but good luck to him. It didn't look that interesting to me. I was like, with the amount of money behind all of this, I just thought you could get like maybe better art and writers, but I, uh, you know, I guess that's all a matter of opinion, isn't it? So I can say that it wasn't for me and I'm not trying to even be political. It just wasn't for me. It didn't look that good, but you know, if other people enjoy it, Hey, it's comics. Fine. Let's talk about something that I always think is cool every year, which is a bunch of creators ending up in a hall of fame. There's a couple, but I think that, you know, the Eisner hall of fame is is fairly prestigious within comics. I mean, I think that that's, you know, the best known awards. I say that, but, you know, I have a lot of respect for a bunch of others. The Ignats, the Harveys, um, there's a bunch of great awards. But the, the, the Eisner Hall of Fame is cool. And this week, the San Diego Comic-Con that administers uh, the awards, uh, they had their judges announce 12 deceased comics professionals and seven living ones that will be inducted into their 2024 Hall of Fame. So first of all, here's some that have passed. Uh, we've got Craig Flessel. Shoot, I know most of these, but I'm having trouble remembering everything that they worked on. Um, A.B. Frost, I could be mistaken, but that might literally be a... Um, what do you call it? Like a... Uh, There's eras of comics, and before the golden age, I've did, done an episode on this. It's it starts with a P, and I'm totally blanking on it. It's it's not it's not the platinum age of comics, but it's something like you know there, there's the Victorian age of comics, and there's the something else I forget. But um, Billy Graham, uh, one of the first uh, successful African American uh, artists in comics, for instance, did a bunch of uh, cool Black Panther books. Albert Cantor, um, blanking on that one. Warren Kramer is a publisher. Oscar Lebeck, Franz Masseril. Oh, Keiji, Keiji Nakazawa did Barefoot Gen, among other things. Talking about, you know, a fictionalized account of his real life experiences experiencing the um, Hiroshima um, atomic bomb. Really, really powerful uh, manga. Noel Sickles um, did a bunch of comic strips and stuff. Cliff Sternett, Elmer C. Stoner. George Tuska is probably the one most of us in here would recognize because uh, while Tuska started early on, he did uh, work on things like um, Iron Man, uh, Daredevil, worked on a bunch of like famous Marvel stuff. Um, living people, we've got Kim Deitch, uh, pretty popular uh, publisher. Gary Groth is a popular publisher. Don McGregor, writer, uh, did some of the early really good uh, Black Panther stories in, it was called something like Jungle Action back then. Uh, Brian Talbot, Ron Turner, Lynn Varley, great colorist. James Warren, publisher of stuff like Eerie and Creepy. Um, yeah, they always uh, induct 19 people, a mix of a lot living and deceased. And then they have fans vote in for more from a list of nominees. So let me go. Um, I believe Dwayne has already been inducted. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm 90 percent sure, but I wouldn't remember what year. Talbot had a book done through Zoop about his work and it's really nice. Oh, thank you for the heads up on that. Uh, and then yeah, in April, so we're coming up on that pretty soon, but in a month, 
we'll get to see the nominations where we, the, the fans, get to vote in for more people. For instance, um, a couple of years ago, um, I, I remember I was like pushing really hard for Larry Hama to get voted in, and I was really excited that he did. Um, just a big fan. So anyway, uh, I'd have to look up these names again, um, but there is a mix of people that worked on uh, comic strips. One of these people, I forget the name, but like definitely did the first comic strip featuring a female lead. That was like, you know, what, what the claim to fame is. Uh, one of them is like a um, French wooden uh, etched artist, but like did it in a um, sequential order and helped in, in, inspire and influence comic strips. Um, yeah, George Perez is definitely in there. So, yeah. A lot of publishers among the living ones. Yep, no question. There's, speaking of Larry Hama, I'm so good at these segues. Uh, there's a new children's graphic novel imprint, and they are having Larry Hama do a book through them. So I like hearing about that. Uh, no, haven't quite gotten to the Scout Comics stuff yet. So uh, Abrams, Abrams is a book publisher. They announced a new imprint called Abrams Fanfare, and they're going to publish children's and middle school graphic novels. Uh, the books are going to start coming out this August, so pr pretty soon. Some of the, their early titles, we've got Black Lives. That's a series of biographies of uh, black scientists. We've got Adventure Game Comics, which is basically choose your own adventure. That's kind of cool. And uh, Myth Makers tells the true life story of the friendship between uh, fantasy writers C.S. Lewis, Narnia, and J.R.R. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings. Pretty cool. Oh, Tari, thank you for the for the kind words. Appreciate that. Thank you. Tusk and Archie Goodwin created the controller. Uh, and then I just wanted to say, don't know what the book is yet, but they did announce that there will be a middle grade series by Larry Hama. Um, guy deserves success. You know, he's been working in comics a very long time now. Um, he, po he posted like two weeks ago that he hasn't had his page rate increased in 30 years. I don't know if that's comics in general or him, but he deserves some success. Yeah, Mythmakers is interesting. But when you think about it, I mean, like, Narnia is definitely, you know, a kid's book. And I think the original Hobbit is definitely a kid's book. So, you know, a story about them meeting and befriending each other is kind of cool. You know, all ages in children's uh, age comics and young adult comics, uh, that is the entry point these days for a lot of people into the world of comics in general. That stuff sells like crazy. Uh, it would be disingenuous to not call it comics. I, they, they flat out are comic books. They just are marketed differently. Uh, you know, you find them in, in your Targets and your Walmarts and your Barnes and Nobles, not your comic book stores as much, but it, it sells like crazy. And it gets people to uh, like the format and the medium, and hopefully they discover some of the other stuff that we all love. Look at that, folks. Finally, finally, some some Rob Liefeld action figures. Uh, and, and wait till you hear how much they cost. So Rob Liefeld announced that there will be figures of the Bloodstrike character Cabot Stone. We all we all love Cabot Stone. He's the best known Rob Liefeld character, right? don't know. Uh, Blood Wolf, not Lobo, Blood Wolf. Third quarter this year, they will come out. They are available for pre-order. They're from a company called Loose Collector. They're 12th scale, so they're, you know, they're big. Uh, 75 bucks each. 75 bucks each. Wowie, kazowie. That's a lot of money. Um, and then I'm just on a related note, since I'm talking about Rob Liefeld, his recently released book, Last Blood, that came out through Whatnot, that includes appearances of, um, some characters that will probably become action figures, you know, uh, it had Prophet, Bloodstrike, Bloodstone, the Berserkers, and, uh, Bo, 
He's an archer from uh, EKO 92, but, but it won't have young blood because Rob does not have the full rights to young blood anymore. Unfortunately, there was some unscrupulous people. Um, I actually feel bad for him that he doesn't have the rights to his best known indie thing. Let's talk about the uh, thing that I've got in the thumbnail, because I do think that this probably got the most discussion going online this past week. And that is uh, a lot of creators called out Scout Comics over non-payment. I was surprised because I thought Scout had a good reputation. Um, and maybe they do, just to be clear. All I'm doing is I'm going to share some comments by creators that work with Scout Comics that came out this week, as well as one of response that Scout issued. Um, I don't know enough about the situation to make a full call, but we can share what we definitely know, which is what people posted. It all really started when Jared Lujan, uh, who's the writer of All the Devils Are Here, he posted this to Twitter. If you're a new creator, please avoid Scout Comics like the plague. Haven't paid me for a book out for over a year, won't answer emails. We delivered a completed profitable book and still got screwed. You know, if that's accurate, that is not right. That is a year. That is crazy. So there was a response. Scout Comics and Entertainment Holdings CEO, Brendan Deenan, Deneen, actually, he said he, he replied to the pop verse. They talked about this story and, and he issued them a comment. He said, we are talking to Jared and currently reaching an amicable solution. Uh, of course, I hope that's the truth. I want everybody to get paid. It would be lovely if it ended right there. If it did, I probably wouldn't quite put it as news. Maybe I would have, maybe I would not have. But once Jared posted this, there were some other posts. Uh, let me share those. Uh, for instance, Matthew Ehrman posted... Long Lost, Lisa Sterl and I's breakout comic, is no longer a Scout Comics title as of today after we mutually agreed to part ways and terminate the publishing contract. So uh, Jared posted on the 28th of February. This was posted on the 29th. Uh, what else? Artist Christian Debari. This is one of his books that he did through Scout. He said over two years ago, Myself and co-creators on a few titles we did went through this with them too. We were met with bullshit threats, lies, and now currently paying off money owed. They are the biggest scam going in terms of a publisher. Wow, that's harsh. I don't know. Uh, by the way, Debari's collaborator, uh, Kiarn Tagan, and I'm probably butchering the names. I do apologize. I'm guessing. He posted... Uh, oh, in response to like um, Scout Comics reply, he says, where was this accountability when we repeatedly asked for details and figures and were instead greeted with anger, denied a contract termination unless we paid 75000 for the huge overprint we didn't ask for? This is a company full of grifters. Don't believe a word of this at all. Yikes. Last one that I'm including and there seemed to be some more, but I, I you know, wasn't going to dig for every single one. Uh, Wells Thompson, the writer of Mechaton, posted, We got a sales report explaining that the book hasn't made its money back, but also haven't gotten any real communication since September, despite repeated attempts to reach out. Honestly, glad to know it's not just us. So, yikes. That's... um. That's 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 interesting. I thought that Scout had a good reputation, but I'm not so sure anymore. Yeah, exactly. The amicable solution is pay people. Um, if you've collected the money from from you know the distributors and the and the retailers, pay pay your talent. Um, the CEO was very petty for review bombing books, Scout books, mind you, and with his real name at that. He did the reviews? I don't know about that. I don't know about that piece. I'm just reading the comment. I I, I don't quite understand that because I don't know. I sh Maybe I should have done more research. Um, This breaks my heart. I was this close to submitting a story to them. I'm not trying to tell you don't submit. I would say 
take into account what other people are saying and also read a contract very carefully. And if you don't understand a contract, please, 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 folks, have a lawyer take a look at it. It will be worth your time. God forbid you, you give away rights that you didn't know that you gave away. So be careful. Be careful is all I want to say. Oh, really? I, I, I've seen some really good Scout comics, just to be clear. Um, I, my friend Randy did a book through them, um, a, a great one-shot horror book about sort of like a Wendigo attacking a very far Canadian town. It was good. It was good. So I don't know. I, I haven't heard anything bad from him. So I'm not saying that everybody ha has said something bad about their experience. Yes, definitely. Have a lawyer look at your contract. If you're serious, if you're at the point where you're signing a contract, just just have a lawyer look at it. It's not going to be that expensive and it'll be it'll be potentially worth your time. Look, maybe your story doesn't isn't successful, but God forbid it is and then you don't have the rights to everything. Yikes. Just yikes. Oh, Dennis Camp did uh, his Agents of World through uh, Scout. Okay, so that's a good book. I mean, certainly a really well-respected writer these days. Well, yeah, yeah, I do too. There's a lot of up-and-coming publishers right now, and this is a day and age where if you've got a decent following on any social platform, you've got a shot at having a successful crowdfunded book. Doesn't mean that it has to publish thousands of copies you could still you know at least pay for your time and get your book out to several hundred really engaged people uh, trust me folks i'm giving it some very serious thought like whether i want to uh potentially crowdfund a comic i i really i don't know it, it seems like a very viable uh, way to go i don't think i'll use rip ascend though <laughs> just to be clear it's just not for me Moving on, moving on. Uh, this is a little obscure, but it this this is to me an example of like you can have like a really, you know, low print run indie book, and you never know if years later it will pay off. For instance, Amazon Prime Video is adapting the El Gato comic book. El Gato is the working title of the show. It's based on the comic series El Gato Negro by Richard Dominguez. Uh, the show will star Diego Boneta. I don't know the actor, I have to admit, but I think he was in the remake recently, uh, Father of the Bride. Anyway, in this bilingual drama series, Bonita will play Frank Guerrero, the black sheep of the family who finds himself at the center of a vast conspiracy when he discovers his father was a 70s vigilante, El Gato. The cat. Uh, production is going to begin this spring in Mexico. So there we go. Will Bill Murray have a role? Sure. Yeah, why not? Uh, I like the this uh, gag. What was it? Uh, the, the owners of Scout Comics were never scouts themselves. A scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, brave, clean, reverent. I think there were three more. I don't remember them all anymore, but I was, I was, I was an Eagle Scout. I think that they must sell decently well. I do see them in plenty of stores, but Hey, you never know what'll happen, right? Like someday maybe you'll uh, get it, get your pay a little later. My gatos, I think, are upstairs eating. Live action. Live action. So, uh, unfortunately, another comic store was broken into this week. This time, it's Maximum Comics out in Las Vegas. So, they've actually been broken into twice in the last month. Yeah. Uh, the owner, Brandon Dold, uh, told the news that the second time around... They broke into the store. I'll explain the first time. But the second time, which was this past week, thieves stole several valuable collectibles, including apparently they had a certified Pokemon video game. I I want to say Emerald, um, which was, I guess, worth thousands. You know, it's in a case. So um, 
They estimated that this time the thieves took about $10,000 worth of merchandise. Ouch, that is a lot for any comic shop. Uh, this is your old comic shop? Yikes. The first break-in in this month was to the store's storage unit, which is apparently in the same parking lot. So they had some stuff stolen from there. Interesting on this one, on top of the loss, um, Dold said that the comic store's security cameras didn't catch the suspects in action. He believed that they disabled the systems before they broke in. So that shows a certain, um, uh, what word do I want to use? Like, sophistication in terms of what kind of criminals they are. Uh, fortunately, however, their neighboring business did capture the crime. So there is some video for the police to go on. There is. Oh my God. I know it's crazy. It's crazy how many break-ins we're getting. It felt like for a little while it slowed down, but I feel like every week I'm coming across one. I think a lot of people suspect that these are inside jobs because they sort of know what to go for. At, on the other hand, I think a lot of comics fans or just, you know, nerdy fans in general know that you can at least grab stuff that's graded and basically just break it out of the case and sell it for a lot. And maybe not as much as if it was graded, but still a lot. And it's harder to track. That is a wild part of this story, if that actually is accurate, that if they disabled the security system, I don't know. Hopefully that gives them some more information than them being the police. We'll see. Uh, I hate to hear it, uh, but I also spread the word just in case somebody in that area happens to hear about some of the stolen merchandise trying to be sold cheap. You know, maybe maybe it's a lead. So we uh, we can at least spread the awareness we can at least spread the awareness. Yes, it likely is the ghost of Frederick Wortham. Good guess, uh, Mike Manhattan. Good guess. Uh, yes, Jason Bourne has gone from fighting government conspiracies to cashing in on those sweet, sweet certified collectibles. My God, Jason Bourne just stole a CGC 9.0 graded Hulk number 181. This is like both sad and happy. Um, last week had to break the news that a, a favorite of mine, Ramona Fraden, had passed away. Um, one of the very few remaining golden age artists that was still alive. But she still has some work coming out, folks. She passed away last week at age 97. But she was literally still working. She she has three covers that are coming out next month for Women's History Month. Yeah, three covers. So they will come out posthumously. What are they? We've got Wonder Woman number seven, Catwoman number 63, uh, and I just didn't have room for everything, uh, Power Girl number seven. And so each of them includes like the main character in the middle and then several other well-known uh, DC uh, super heroines. Uh, pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Uh, inks on these were done by Sandra Hope. Colors by Trish Mulvihill. But yeah, some new artwork by Ramona Fraden still coming out. These are variant covers, but folks, you have to imagine that with her just passing within the last month, that that's going to be in some pretty high demand. But isn't that like, I mean, can you imagine drawing like this at age 97? I'm not saying that this is necessarily today's style or super detailed or anything, but it's clean. It doesn't really have weird proportions or anything. It's fun. And just the idea that someone was, you know, like working in comics up until her final days is, is just absolutely amazing to me. Uh, yeah, trust. So I am uh, working on a Ramona Fraden episode for comic tropes, but it probably won't be the next one that I release. just to be clear. Neat design. It's kind of cool seeing her version of the modern characters. I agree. Um, that's impressive. Love Ramona style. Yep. Starfire looks great. Um, 
She will be missed. Ramona, yes. Uh, let's see. Clean, expressive, unique style. I see Harley Quinn. I like this style. Very hard to tell someone in the 90s made this. It's still very well done. No question. She was still doing commissions up until very recently. Uh, that, that would be fun. Pins of those would be really fun. Yeah. You know, she came in towards, just to be clear, of course, the tail age, uh, tail end, I should say, of the golden age. Um, but that's just numbers at this point, folks. I mean, she was 97. She started in comics in something like 1951. Golden age was basically uh, very early 60s. I mean, silver age was very early 60s. Um, I, I looked it up and there's literally only like about, that I could find maybe three artists and writers that were working in the golden age that are still alive. Um, Jack Katz is more indie. Uh, Angelo Torres from Puerto Rico. Um, I want to say he did like some Conan stuff. Uh, I, it's hard to remember. Um, probably best known at this point of who's left. Larry Lieber, Stan Lee's younger brother. Um, you know, he was the co-creator of characters like Ant-Man and Iron Man. Um, you know, it's just numbers at this point. Like very few people that were alive back then in the golden age. Um, and it's sad to me to think that like, you know, in the last couple of years, you know, we've lost the last few luminaries, you know, like the, your, your John Ramita seniors or something, you know, like the big names. Was there another golden age artist that passed away recently? Um, I mean, last year was John Ramita senior 2023. Yeah. Anyway, I don't want to uh, be too sad. I think it's really, really cool that Ramona, still has new artwork coming out this this month just amazing so be on the lookout if you get one congrats uh jerry duggan has a book called luck uh, i mean excuse me timing slash luck so he did this uh, uh, he did a photo book it was a, a kickstarter in 2023 but this week image comics announced that it's going to publish it in wide release uh i'm glad i think i'd like to get this book it's all sorts of candid shots Jerry took of stand-up comedians, uh, Comic-Con stuff, uh, comic book creators. You know, Jerry works uh, in, in, in the entertainment industry as well as writing a bunch of comics. So he just has been, and he's, he's got a professional series of cameras and he's been taking pictures for a long time. Um, this is a cool idea. There's literally so many people that he's listed in his shots that we'd know that I couldn't fit them all. So I just let it go off the page. But, uh, fun question. What would top three cosplays you'd do top three that I would do? Jeez. I don't know if I've got the body type or the face for too many, um, too many cosplays. So maybe I'd have to do stuff that's like, you know, all armored up or something, you know, I'll do, uh, Rocket Red from Justice League Europe. You can cover me up uh, that way. Um, who else could I possibly play? Uh, uh, geez, I'll, I'll play Iron Man without the mask up. And I'll play... Um, uh, geez, I'll play uh, uh, Spawn. <laughs> I'll play Spawn. <laughs> yeah, actually... The one I'd love to play, uh, uh, take out Spawn and put in Paste Pot Pete. We'll sub in uh, Paste Pot Pete. So anyway, yeah, I just got like tons of names. They go right off. But it's like almost anyone you could think of in comics, uh, as well as a lot of people that are, you know, just in the entertainment industry and stuff. I mean, look, John Hamm, Clint Eastwood, <laughs> Weird Al, Patton Oswalt, Tom Lennon. Yeah. But look at everybody knows, you know, Kirkman and McFarlane. I don't know. Donny Cates. Um, pretty sure this is Chip Zdarsky. I think this is Al Ewing. This is definitely Jock, the artist Jock, just driving at night. Um, and he's got photos like when he's been at like uh, in foreign countries for like Comic Cons and stuff like that. Just really cool shots of the city at night and in the rain. He's a good photographer. He's got some really beautiful pictures there. So I'm looking forward to this. It isn't strictly a comic book, but it has comic book creators in it. And I think that can be fun. Rorschach. Rorschach isn't a bad idea. I could play Rorschach. Harrow County is, in my opinion, a really good 
comic, a really good horror comic, and it's getting a board game. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, you know what? Way more comic books should have board games, tabletop games, role-playing games, and, and, and card games. I know there are a lot out there. And then all of a sudden, I was like, Jesus, almost every comic feels like it could be made into a cool game. Uh, and, and I like the idea of thinking of them as board games because you get the artist involved, don't you? So, Harrow County, The Game of Gothic Conflict. It's coming out to uh, retail the 6th, this Wednesday, 65 bucks. Uh, it's for either one up to three players. Going to take you between 45 to 90 minutes. It's based on the horror comic by writer Cullen Bunn, artist Tyler Crook. I love Tyler Crook's art in that. I made an episode about it If you on comic tropes. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you should really take a look. Um, players fight for control of Harrow County as the Protectors the family, or Emmy's sister, Kami. A third player can also join in as the witch, Hester. Very cool idea. Uh, so it's a tactical game based on territory control. And if you're curious, artist Tyler Crook does a weekly live stream on Fridays. And sometimes if you tune into his weekly live stream, the comic book cooldown, you can, you, you've been able to see him like work on, um, pieces of art for things like this. Yeah. Ah, there you go. Yep. Yeah. Why isn't there tons of Hellboy board games? <laughs> Chris Ware comic and board game. I like that. Uh, I've always wondered why nobody made a TCG game that can also tell a comic book story. Yeah, that would be good. That would be good. So anyway, um, Tyler Crook's YouTube channel is really chill, by the way. Every Friday he does, uh, he calls his show, The Comic Book Cooldown. He does a lot of his work with uh, watercolors. Uh, it's a really nice community there. It's, it, it's you know, there's a lot of good YouTube shows by artists where they just do their thing. It's really chill. You've probably heard about this one, but yeah, James Gunn's Superman did start production this week. Uh, so if you don't know, Leap Day is canonically Superman's birthday. February, uh, yeah, February 29th. And for leap year this day, kind of fitting, uh, James Gunn announced that filming has begun on Superman. It's no longer called Superman Legacy. This is just Superman. It's the, the movie that he's writing and directing. Uh, if you haven't heard, and you probably did, but yeah, it's got David Corn Sweat as Superman. He's definitely got the look. Rachel Brosh, uh, Brosnahan as Lois Lane. Nicholas Holt is Lex Luthor. Uh, Isabella Merced, she was just in Madam Web, but now you get to see her as hot girl. We've got Maria Gabriela de Faria as the engineer. Nathan Fillion as Guy Gardner. Anthony Kerrigan as Metamorpho. Ramona Fraden created character. Uh, Edie Gathegi as Mr. Terrific. Skylar Gasondo as Jimmy Olsen. Sarah Sampeo as Eve Tessmacher. And finally, Terrence Rosemore as Otis. A lot of interesting characters. Yes, Tyler Crook's art in The Lonesome Hunters is also pretty fantastic. Yep, they also posted, you're right, a selfie of the cast, and that's cool. <laughs> Philly and his guy is because James Gunn and Nathan Philly and are pals. <laughs> no ho, Hank, exactly right. Now, it, it's nice to see that Anthony Kerrigan, a guy you know, who has, um, I want to say it's alopecia or something where, where he doesn't have hair. So he's got a unique look, but he's had some really good roles. I, I believe he played Mr. Zaz on the show Gotham, uh, but he was great as Noho Hank in Barry on HBO. And he really strikes me as a great casting for Metamorpho. Otis and Tessmacher are not technically really from the comics so much as they are from other Superman media, which is very much in keeping, if you don't know, with how Superman has developed. Uh, because, you know, for instance, he got his ability to fly uh, with animation. It was easier to draw him just hovering in the air than it was to draw him landing from a great leap, things like that. Otis was uh, his, what do you call it? Um, his side, Lex Luthor's henchman, 
in the original Richard Donner Superman movies. Uh, and then um, there was Miss Tessmacher was, was sort of Lex Luthor's uh, mistress. And then uh, in the animated uh, Superman, the animated series in the nineties, they created a uh, mercy graves, which was sort of his, um, his bodyguard. And so I think that Eve Tessmacher is sort of merging uh, Mercy and Miss Tessmacher together. I'm pretty sure. But anyway, let's all hum the Otis theme. Exactly. So I, but you know what? As soon as I saw that, I was like, oh yeah, you don't tend to see Lex have many goofy or any sort of henchmen in the comics regularly. But I think it sort of gives that villain something to play off of, you know? It, it 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 allows him to explain his plans without just sort of I don't know it's it's nice yes you're fashionably late anyway uh, so those are characters that more came from the uh, expanded media Otisburg exactly right Chem Dog uh, last piece of news I have is that Daniel Warren Johnson is going to release essentially an artist edition of his book Extremity, which you may not have encountered, but was a 12 issue series he did at Skybound back in the day. And uh, so, yeah, this is pretty cool. It it's, uh, starts tomorrow, starts tomorrow on Kickstarter. It's called the Signature Edition, just to be clear. It's going to be 12 by 17. So that means it's the same size as the original art. 320 pages, hardcover, collecting all 12 issues of Extremity. Uh, it reprints the art at the original board size. And I believe what they've done is they've taken scans of the color art and then turned that into black and white pages. So they didn't like grayscale it. They took the color pages and they converted it to gray, which should give you more fidelity. Uh, also available at this Kickstarter will be the art of Extremity. Uh, which is more like letter size, 128 page hardcover collecting concept art, sketches, things like that. I think it sounds like a cool addition. There's the link so that it's on screen if people want to, or basically I'm sure you could just type in Extremity or Daniel Warren Johnson and Kickstarter and you will find it. By the way, this book will have what's called a tip in. That's where there's a piece of art that's published, it, it's included within the book. It's like a book plate, but it's printed separately and then just put inside like the front cover. Uh, it will look like this. At least this is what Daniel Warren Johnson said on one of his live streams. What's that to Chris? Apparently, I don't know if this is accurate or not, but Daniel said he was sending me this art. So if you get it and you see that tip in reproduced, uh, I guess I'm the one that gets that sketch, which is <laughs> obviously uh, makes me uh, pretty excited. As you know, I'm a fan. Specific, I never would have asked for anything like that. I I know Dan, Dan really likes playing with different types of pens and nibs and stuff like that. I came across a unique one, uh, Kaminori, and I sent it to him just because I thought he might get a kick out of experimenting with it. And so he, uh, he did this and that was his way of saying, thank you. He said, anyway, pretty exciting. Got it. Let's talk about the comics that came out this week. What? I'm almost ready. I'm almost ready for you. I've got the camera on and everything. We kind of talked about this at the top of the show folks, but last mermaid, look at how lush the colors are. And obviously we learned from the interview that that's, uh, that's digital, but this is a hundred percent by Derek Kirk Kim. Isn't that interesting? And I had no idea that it was planning such a long thing, but this is a really pretty looking book. I think that like that the format suits it in a really interesting way. Obviously Derek seemed concerned that like, Hey, you know, retailers might be less inclined to buy something that's at a different set of dimensions because maybe it's harder to put on their shelves. Uh, that's a fair concern, but I, I like seeing things that take advantage. And 
this gives us a really unique way of reading it. Like you said, it's storyboard size. So you almost get like sort of like, you know, a, a top half and a bottom half that he can play with a lot of the time, but not exclusively. You know, sometimes there's like a two thirds establishing shot. Anyway, that's a, a, a lot of talk about like the um, the format and stuff. What's nice about this is uh, the design and the concept. I mean, it's just kind of cool seeing a mermaid operate a mech, but she's in so much danger from the beginning. You know, like we, we get these little periodic updates where uh, we see what the water toxicity level is because, you know, she's rebreathing this stuff. It, it's essentially like breathing oxygen is scuba diving, but she's breathing this, this uh, water and she'll need to change it, but she's crossing the desert. Like where is she going to come across water? And it just gets worse from there. It just gets worse. Uh, because at a certain point in this, just to be clear, it gets cracked. How do you cross a desert with toxic water that's running out? I don't know. That's a concern. That's a concern. I think it looks cool. I wanted to talk it up. I recommend it. I think it's a really great start to a premise. Uh, we will see where it goes. Like I say, that doesn't come out that, that, that comes out this Wednesday. So it's not technically out yet, but it will be this Wednesday. Here's another book that comes out this Wednesday. This is just a convention exclusive cover, but it is the, um, it's the, it's the continuation of the last Ronin stuff, which was obviously wildly successful for IDW. Uh, la it's now called last Ronin two with the subtitle Revolution. Uh, co-written with Kevin Eastman. He's been very involved in Ninja Turtles since they came to uh, IDW. Tom Waltz has been writing since the beginning. Um, art by the same team that did the, the last Ronin books. But we're going forward into the future. The last Ronin was the last surviving Ninja Turtle in the near future uh, with an older April and April's daughter, Casey Marie, fighting back against the Shredder's grandson because Karai is his daughter and this was Karai's son. Anyway, now we're going further into the future because now uh, Casey Marie is leading like a band of revolutionaries, like just sort of like um, trying to keep back all the gangs that are in this future version of New York and things get really bad. They're like super understaffed and uh, she has no choice but to um, I got to go forward because we get introduced to all the characters. If you if you don't know the characters, folks, this is an intro period. Uh, OK, yeah. So she she hears that like one of their sort of um, or two of their places are getting attacked and they don't have enough manpower to defend both. So she makes the call to finally like let the uh, the now teenage new mutant Ninja Turtles help. She's been training them since they were babies. They were introduced at the tail end of um, Last Ronin as babies that had been exposed to mutagen. There are four new turtles, two male, two female. They all have names that mean one in um, different languages. So there's like uh, Uno and Odin, etc. And they're very different. They're, they're all different turtles. Let me see if I can show you. So like, you know, they have different designs, which helps. We need to get to know them a little better. Uh, but they're not like, um, they're not repeats of Leonardo, Raphael, Donatello, Michelangelo. It's not a repeat of that. It, you get some new personalities. It's a new family. It's a new environment. There's a lot of things to play with. There's a lot of things to play with. But what works is it emphasizes the core things that always seem to work well in Ninja Turtles. Family, just martial arts, um, and weird sci-fi ideas weird sci-fi ideas. So it's, it's a little tied to the past because it's got still, um, April. That's about actually, now that I think of it, the only thing that would tie back to the original era of Ninja Turtles, April is still around, but, um, yeah, right. The new Ninja Turtles, they are using things like bow staffs and Psy and nunchuck and, and, and Katana, um, and they each sort of specialize in using one more than the other, but they use other weapons too. 
they use other weapons too. It's decent. It's it, it's better than decent, actually. Um, I, I had a good time. I want to get to know the characters uh, a little better so that I can just glance at them and know them. And and I'm I'm going I'm going like boy you know I look at them and I and I don't know them the same way that I know our Ninja Turtles. But then again, forty years of being exposed to the Ninja Turtles means they're pretty iconic. And I'm trying to remember I'm like yeah they probably didn't seem as memorable when I started reading the comics in like maybe '86 and they were black and white you know. They didn't have like, you know, the, the, their personalities, voices and colors from the show. Like originally they all look the same. So, yeah. Uh, is it worth the nine? Is that how much it was? This is the convention exclusive. I honestly forget how much I paid for this. Wow. Uh, nine dollars. Mm. It's it's a big issue. It's a big issue. I guess this is a double issue. I guess by by today's standards, it, I'll say it like this. If you like Ninja Turtles, and especially if you liked Last Ronin, then yes, it's worth it. It's not a bad value. It's not cheap, but yeah, it's worth it. It's worth it. Exactly. Yeah, the original Ninja Turtles. First, the interior pages were all black and white, and the covers, they all just wore red. So it used to actually be, now that I'm thinking of it, a little harder to tell them apart in terms of personality and stuff like that. Wow, thanks for the super chat, Larry. Hey, Chris, how do you feel about the crest? I love how it combines kingdom come shape with classic red and yellow and Fleischer style yellow shield outline. Got it. Okay, so you're talking about the, um, the Superman crest that we saw, right? Uh, the, for, for the new movie? I like it. Yeah, it uses the... Um, the kingdom comes sort of jagged like S, but you have to give something a little new that we haven't seen in live action before. You have to do that a little bit, I think, to differentiate it. Um, but it's still nice, bright colors. So I like that. And it does, like you said, it also reminds me, and I think the kingdom come was riffing on this too, of the Fleischer style. So that was definitely still really early Superman. I think it's totally fair to use. I think it's Fair, and it, I like that it's bright. I do. I think that Superman needs bright, vibrant colors. That's what works. I I hope he has trunks. I really do like the trunks. Um, Some other good books did come out this week, just to be clear. I'll, I'll try to be kind of brief with this. But Avengers Twilight, folks, is actually kind of the kingdom come for the Marvel world. This is set in, in, in the near future, not, not even necessarily a full generation in the future, but basically a generation in the future where America has become pretty fascist, but it's not just America's fault. We've been introduced to the fact that uh, Ultron and Red Skull have been manipulating things behind the scenes for a long time. They, they, they formed a long-term goal. And into this, Captain America um, had been forced to, to get rid of his super soldier serum, but he sees how bad things have gotten and he's taken it again. And this is really actually positive, like uh, as far as like being hopeful, because Captain America is inspiring those around him. He's impressing them with what he does. And, you know, he's making people come back to being heroes. He changes. There's like a new uh, version of Bullseye that's um, a government, uh, well, a, a Marine assassin. And he wins. He wins uh, this version of Bullseye over. He convinces Kamala Khan to come out of retirement. Uh, there's good enemies. This one's a, just a great issue featuring Captain America having to break into the raft basically solo to, to recover what's left of Iron Man. Um, but it's cool. Wait, there's one really great shot I got to show you. And I like how positive Captain America is in this because he's like, he insists no one dies today. You know, he's staying by his convictions. Look at that shot of, of him rescuing someone from an exploding ship. And it impresses everyone. 
Like even like this bad, like enemy says, wow, not half bad. <laughs> That's very positive and uplifting. So what's happened here is, is he did run for president or at least maybe senator or something. I think he ran for president in this and um, he didn't win. He didn't win politically. Uh, things were not going his way. But, you know, just to be clear, we find out that a lot of the media is being manipulated. Again, Red Skull and Ultron. You put those two together and yeah, there's a lot of danger they can do. Red Skull has always been effective at manipulating the media without access to a super intelligent robot, right? So you put them together and uh, and how do their goals align? Not clear yet, but it is plausible to me that they could like, you know, have created a darker version of the future. It doesn't mean that everybody's all the citizens are like evil or bad people, you know, they're, they're, they don't know any better because this has been a very slow, long process of taking away people's um, ability to use like their cameras on their phones and stuff. So, so information is not freely getting shared. Anyway, <laughs> I definitely remember that Howard the Duck declared his presidential run. Yes. Uh, anyway. I think Red Skull promised the world to Ultron after he dies. It might might have been that. Yeah. I think he just wants revenge on Captain America and the Avengers. Um, it's a cool plan. I'm trying not to spoil all the details of it. But uh, Daniel Acuna's art uh, is detailed, but obviously like there's there's a darkness to it, which suits the world building and the tone. I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, but there's still good action sequences. And I like that it's hopeful. It's a bleak sort of world, but Captain America is literally making it better. And I like that. I like that a lot. It's it's a cool example of, again, putting your protagonist in a situation where they're, they're really overwhelmed by how bad the scenario is. You know, they're, they're really overwhelmed. And yet, they're coming from behind. Here's a similar idea. Radiant black folks. Let me let me give you an idea of this. So this is so ambitious. But right now, what Radiant Black is doing is every month, two issues come out together. And it takes place at the same time, but in a, a, a slightly different timeline. In one version, we have uh, the the main character of Marshall has the radiant black powers and he's trying to figure out these tests that are being administered by an alien force called the catalyst, which is apparently where the radiant powers come from. They're trying to test his worthiness and things are getting dark. They're getting real dark in this version. He has lost his best friend, Nathan, who, to be clear, is the protagonist of the second timeline, and he's the one who has the um, radiant powers. Uh, let me find that. Yeah, so in this one, Nathan has the radiant powers, and he has very different choices for how to beat the challenges. Um, but he loses somebody important in this issue. So I don't know which timeline will come out ahead. But to be clear, in both timelines, the main hero is losing somebody really important to them. And wow, uh, one of these will probably become the, the main timeline, I think. But if it does, there's going to be some real heartbreaking loss that we're going to have to deal with the ramifications of. In the meantime, all of Earth is at stake. This alien force is just ridiculously powerful. Uh, I'm reading it monthly, and I like that. But I will say, Radiant Black reads best in trade paperback format, folks, because um, there are a bunch of supporting characters, and each issue isn't sort of reintroducing you to everything important about them like, say, a Marvel comic from the 80s does with tons of dialogue. It expects you to sort of remember where you are. And on a monthly basis, 
it's a little trickier. It's a little trickier. I, I will admit, as a fan, I'm having trouble remembering some of the supporting characters, like the the, the nuances of who they are. So I am having a tr trouble with that. It probably reads a lot better as 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 a gra as a trade. I think it is, uh, but I don't know exactly how or why it's happening. I really don't. But yes, I do think it's part of the, the, the alien trials, which is cool because the trials are very unknowable. You know, they're, they're asking them to solve problems and we don't really know what solution they're looking for. Who did, who did I vote for? I voted. Who did I? I think I voted for Nathan. We'll see who wins. Uh, one is going to be the main Radiant Black after Catalyst War is over, which is due in part to the fan vote from the end of issue 24 back in May of 2023. Right. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I voted for, for Nathan, um, but I'm not going to tell you guys anything. Uh, uh, well, I, I don't know how this one's coming up. I, sorry, I was about to, to say, like, I, I'm not going to give you any spoilers, but I don't know any spoilers for this. I, I know some of the things that Kyle Higgins is working on. I'm not going to spoil any of that either. That's un unfortunately for the show, it's all off the record, but Kyle has some really exciting stuff coming up and I do like Radiant Black a lot. I do. It's a great superhero book. And I came into this uh, after somewhere close to like when 12 issues had been out because people in the chat were like really recommending it as a uh, book that I should be reading. And I'm glad you guys did. I like it. tell you what i'm gonna end on this is like because like immortal thor it's good i don't have a lot to say but duke in the energon universe continues to surprise uh let's just say some characters die in this that i wouldn't have expected to i thought that they would be main characters but you know what's great about this uh we've talked i think a lot about the writing joshua williamson is doing some interesting things with the mythology and and, and all but um this art by tom riley really suits the book it's it's clean, but you know his, his characters are, you know, either really sexy or really beefy. Um, he doesn't skimp on the details for backgrounds and stuff like that. He's great at the action. Look at this two-page spread of troopers invading, like a military installation to uh, potentially kill Duke. These are these are not. Cobra troopers, they are major bloods henchmen, but I and they're and they're funded by Destro, I believe. So they have a lot of elements that sort of hearken to Cobra troops, major bloods armor, and maybe even a little of Destro. It's it's kind of cool. That's interesting. Robbie Rosari says that character is not really dead. I'm betting that's possible, I guess. I guess that is possible. We'll see. Uh, but in this one, Duke and his best friend from childhood, Clutch, and Baroness have all been arrested. Okay? And now a squad is coming to kill them. And things get bad. And they maybe have to team up. But will that work? I loved uh, how effective... Major Blood was in this, by the way. Major Blood is a mercenary. And, uh, yeah, he's pretty cool. Oh, Rob, I just put together why you think maybe he's not dead. Because I'm looking at this versus remembering what his current action figure looks like. And I see what you mean. Maybe, maybe this character is not dead. But... He definitely gets a good win here. Look, he shoots Duke right through the leg. There are big stakes in this book. Baroness is great in this. She definitely, like, you know, I don't know exactly where any of her allegiances lie. Yeah, the Bloodhounds, which is a great name for a squad. Great name for squad. Um, I just found out G.I. Joe started out as a British toy comic. No, it did not start out by that. There was a version it started here in America, just to be clear. And it was G.I. Joe. That's why it's called G.I. Joe. There was an adaptation for the British market called Action Force, both the, a toy line and a comic. But it did start here. Just let, let's be clear about that. It started in the 60s, and it was sort of rebooted, uh, the version that we all know well, 
in um, 82 with a new toy line working closely with Marvel, um, working with guys like Jim Shooter and definitely Larry Hama to develop the idea and the concept. Baroness is great in this comic. She's not like, you know, in her, she's in a very reminiscent uniform as is Duke, but they're not technically in their suits that we've seen in the comics uh, and the, in the toys yet. Thank you for the info. Um, well, there weren't really different British characters. It was just a slightly different continuity where the team was more international. Um, I do have an episode where I talk about sort of rare G.I. Joe comics. And in one of them, I do talk about an issue of Action Force. One thing they did there is uh, Marvel UK ran it. And they specifically said that the character Quick Kick was trained by Shang-Chi. So it, it legit um, sort of pretends like it's in the Marvel Universe. But to be clear, that's the Marvel UK version of the Marvel Universe. It's not really 616. It can get confusing. It can get confusing. But um, I like what they're doing with the Energon Universe. They're, 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 they're shaking it all up. You know, it's, it's stuff that looks familiar. But it's never just a rehash. You know, Transformers started with Bumblebee getting destroyed in issue one. He's gone. It's got Starscream as the leader of the Decepticons, not Megatron. Um, the Cobra Commander book is a horror book that introduces Cobra Law. Well, we'd seen that in, the, obviously, the animated movie. But Cobra Law has never been in the comics like this. Um, and Duke has him as like, you know, like America's best soldier. And he's, he's looking into, well, he doesn't know the, the, the nature of it, but he saw Starscream. He's looking into that and it, it puts him on the outs with the government. He's a man on the run. The government is trying to, you know, like arrest him and get him like, you know, back into the fold. And he's just on his own mission. And I'll tell you, Duke has really got some personality in this and he's got, um, you know, he's got no resources and he's trying to figure out something that's bigger than him. And it inadvertently puts him, um, you know, on a collision course with Destro's Mars Corporation and possibly some other problems. But it all does connect in interesting ways. In Cobra Commander, you do see Destro with the Baroness. Yes. Yes, it all is um, crossing over. It's 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 fun, folks. If you like this and you you're up for a new take on the material, give it a try. I think sometimes that works really well. Ninja Turtles. Ninja Turtles has had so many different versions of TV shows and movies, and the comics have rebooted in different continuities. You know, there's the Mirage continuity. There was the Image comics follow up. There was the Archie sort of adventure series that ran for a long time. There's the IDW reboot and, and that's, you know, like, and, and, and a lot of them, I think like work really, really well. Well, I think that this Energon universe, I like it. It's probably not for everybody. I've got a really good friend, Tim, who loves GI Joe, doesn't really love Transformers. So he doesn't love that Transformers are an integral, important, you know, part of all this. And I get it. I do, but I, it works for me. It works for me. I like it. That's a lot of Joes. Yes, there there have been a lot. Uh, Image TMNT was a fun wild run for that was a violent dark one, take on things. Yeah, I, I mean, so for me, I, I'm happy with that because I, I get both versions that I like. I the the real American hero version by Larry Hama that started back in '82 is still going, and I love that. I love that. Um, so I've got that continuity and then I've also got this one and I don't mind two different continuities at the same time. I think we're in a day and age where a lot of people um, accept that. Like how many different Batman continuities are sort of concurrently running at any one time? We've got the spider verse. We've got the ultimate universe. We've got else worlds. I think we're at a time where readers are, I just realized I don't need these anymore. Jesus. Um, readers are pretty sophisticated when it comes to comics. And I think that they don't have to read every continuity, but I think they understand that there are different continuities. 
I think they understand that at this point. I really just don't, I don't think it confuses people to have two different stories with the same characters. There's probably a limit, you know, like if there were three G.I. Joe continuities, maybe then that does start getting confusing. Maybe that does. But yeah. let's see. Isn't the Energon universe supposed to gain other ISPs Hasbro owns also? Not that I've heard. Not that I've heard. I think that the Energon universe is literally the G.I. Joe stuff, the Transformers stuff, and the new Void Rivals stuff that Kirkman uh, creates in his book, Void Rivals. But that's space set, and it does cross over with Transformers characters and concepts. But I think it's just those. I'm pretty sure the Energon universe has not hinted at any plans to, say, roll in mask or rom and things like that they've they, they did something like that at idw like once i want to say it was called like revolution but i'm pretty sure the energon universe does not intend to be that ambitious let's see i was never interested in gi joe growing up so for the longest time thought it followed a soldier named joe totally understand well uh canonically gi joe does have um, a guy named Joe Colton that was basically the first G.I. Joe. So you're not wrong for whatever it's worth. You're not wrong. Um, I thought I was going to have more time uh, to do some art. I, I don't think that's realistic, but you know what? In a way, it's just as well because I've I just realized um, I love using brush pens and I don't have any right now. Um, they're all shot. They're all shot. So you know what? Um, tell you what. Uh, if I don't have a guest next week, I'll have some time to to draw. I'll have some time to draw because I love drawing with you guys. Um, I'll, I'll and I'll, and in the meantime, I'll get some. I'll get myself some new pens so that I've got something to work. I can do dry brush. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure that that's all they they've obtained is just exactly. I'm per, like there's certainly been no hints that there's more properties to work in. And you know what? I'm okay with that. It's a little interesting to think of rolling in something like mask to GI Joe could work. I don't think it's necessary. Um, you know, some people will disagree with how well GI Joe and transformers mesh. I think that's a fair concern. Uh, I wouldn't really call the original Marvel crossover that good. I, I didn't like it all that much, but, um, but there was some fun G.I. Joe versus Transformers stuff that Tom Scioli did, where it just goes bonkers. I hate to be a jerk, but you guys know I'm like a, a little bit of a grammar jerk. Uh, and um, that's not going to change because you actually got the uh, phrase right. So I'm going to shut up. I was about to correct you. You got it right. Champing at the bit. Oh, did I just come off as an asshole? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i was totally about to correct uh the phrase and then i read it more carefully and you totally got it right <laughs> i'm such a jerk i was like mm, mm, actually i'm gonna correct something and uh, i can't correct that i can't correct that that was you got that you nailed it uh yeah i'm gonna have some dinner i think trying to think if there was anything else comic book related that I was going to talk about this week. I don't think so. Uh, I haven't gone to the store to pick up any manga recently, so I need to pick up some manga. I'm glad you guys are um, having fun laughing at that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, everybody says I'm chomping at the bit, but that's not the phrase. It's champing at the bit. You can read up on what that is, but it's called champing at the bit. All right. I think we had a good show, right? Let me leave you with this. I sincerely think people will like this book, The Last Mermaid by Derek Kirk Kim. It's a good premise. The art is lush and it's cute. It's charming. You know, the, the mermaid, she's, she's pretty. And her cute little companion, the axolotl. There's a lot to like about it, but it's in such a dangerous world. 
It's in such a dangerous world. Sorry, I'm just having fun. So I wanted to put that on folks' radar. This comes out in stores this week. If your store has it, hopefully you're one of the folks to get it. And maybe we can start a little bit of interest and try to make sure that this does continue because I like it. So I'm trying to use my my pressure to to leverage that and, and, and push it to some success. I hope so. Axolotl should get a spinoff. Yes. Rom is back with Marvel for now. Not new stuff, though, just to be clear. They've only got the rights to reprint their original run. I, they're not doing anything new with, with it. Same with Micronauts. They're just reprinting. Uh, the kitties were down here right when the show started, but I think my wife fortunately fed them, so they're um, probably playing and cuddling with her. I'm going to call it a night, but um, yeah, uh, one, one nice thing talking to... Uh, Kyle Higgins at Emerald City Comic Con was that he intimated he was still open to me drawing a backup page. So I think that I owe him that. I think I'm going to go for it and see if I can get something that he likes. That could be fun, right? So uh, that's what I'll try to draw next week. Oh, you know what will happen between now and um, when we see each other next week? I keep thinking I'm going to leave, but I remember something. Uh, two things. One, I'm pretty sure I should have an episode of Comic Tropes up this weekend. I'm really close. I know it's taken a while. Um, people are abandoning the Patreon because I'm not uploading fast enough. It, it hurts. I, I think I'll have I'll have that up this weekend, and hopefully people like it. I think it's a, a cool, interesting new angle on on um, uh, an artist. And second, I'm pretty sure that uh, Jim and I will be ready to launch trash movie bonanza this week so that will have us reviewing a movie about a comic book artist so it does relate um yeah when i don't um upload new episodes fast enough like people do leave the patreon which which boy do i feel so i've always got pressure to produce episodes i've always got that pressure it's not just uh it's not just youtube that will like financially penalize me it's uh patreon as well so we'll we'll, we'll do that but yes that's exciting right so i i should have um i should have two new shows up for you probably before we see each other again i think i think i'll have two shows up that'll be cool all right everybody take care thank you keep reading comics what do we do here? We do a bunch of these, but we mostly do a devil salute. You've earned it. You've always earned it. Thank you, everybody. Love you. Take care.